Oscars. Monster <laughs> Madness. It's October again, and it's time to look at some of the most famous horror movies and their sequels. For the rest of this week, I'll be looking at the classic Frankenstein series produced by Universal Studios. The choice was simple. It's the first long-running horror franchise. It includes eight films, and it crosses over with The Wolfman and Dracula. So that gives us the most monsters for our madness. The novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley was written in 1816 and published in 1818. It's been performed on stage and made into a short film by Thomas Edison in 1910. But it was the 1931 Universal film that made it as famous as it is to this day. Even the most minor things were changed. In the novel, Frankenstein's first name is Victor, but in the movie, it's Henry. In the novel, he has a friend named Henry, and in the movie, he has a friend named Victor, so they swap the names around as if they want it to be as confusing as possible. In the novel, Frankenstein creates a monster without any assistance. The addition of a hunchback servant was something that was only imagined for the movie. Yet, it's become a famous cliché. Lots of people assume the servant's name is Igor, but it's actually Fritz. And this time we're ready. Hey, Fritz! It wasn't until the third film, Son of Frankenstein, when there was a guy named Igor, and then it was spelled with a Y, not an I like most people imagine. I think it may have been the Mel Brooks parody, Young Frankenstein, that popularized the name Igor and made it synonymous with that of Frankenstein's assistant. You must be Igor. Now it's pronounced Igor. Anyway, back to the differences with the novel. In the novel, after Frankenstein gives life to the monster, he is appalled by it and abandons it. In the movie, he's confident in his creation. It's all the other people who hate the monster. I guess it's best I back up and relay the plot. The movie begins in a gloomy cemetery with Frankenstein and Fritz stealing a freshly buried corpse. Next thing, they're cutting down the body of a hanged man. Frankenstein is planning to use the different body parts for his creation. An arm here, a leg there, a dick there, whatever. But it's the brain he's having the most trouble with. Frankenstein's former professor, Dr. Waldman, is teaching a class on the difference between a normal brain and an abnormal one. The class ends, and luckily they just leave the two brain specimens sitting there alone. Frankenstein seizes the opportunity and sends Fritz into the room to steal one of them. He goes for the normal brain first, but then drops it like an idiot, and then has to go for the abnormal brain, which is why the monster turns out the way he is. During a severe storm, he prepares to bring his creation to life. Dr. Waldman shows up at his door along with his friend Victor and his fiancée, whom he's been very absent-minded toward. At first, he tries to shoo them away, but decides he might as well let them be witnesses. What you're looking at is the prototype of all mad scientist scenes, and still one of the finest. Who knows what all those electrical gadgets are supposed to do, but who cares? It's a dazzling display of sparks and flashing lights, crackling and buzzing and snapping and popping. Frankenstein's guests think he's out of his mind trying to reanimate a dead body, but he lets them know how serious he is with a cold stare, some stern dialogue, and the crashing of thunder to fill the background which all complete an ominous atmosphere. Henry, you're in here. You're crazy. Crazy, am I? We'll see whether I'm crazy or not. With a bolt of lightning, Frankenstein brings the body to life and gets so excited he has to be restrained. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> Surprisingly, you never see the monster get up off the table or see his face right away. Instead, you're kept in suspense. Two scenes later, Frankenstein and Dr. Waldman are discussing the consequences. Waldman thinks he's created a monster, but Frankenstein is still confident. Then, the monster finally shows up by opening a door with his back, moonwalking into the room, slowly turning, and then a series of jump cuts zoom in to his death-like face. It's a little strange, but the monster's first appearance here is savored quite nicely. The monster obeys Frankenstein's commands, and everything's under control until Fritz ruins everything. The monster gets angry and has to be confined to a prison cell located somewhere in Frankenstein's lair. Fritz harasses the monster with a whip and torch and ends up getting himself killed. It's not shown on screen, but effective just the same. They have to sedate the monster, and Frankenstein allows Waldman to kill it by dissection. But the monster wakes up, strangles him, runs away, 
accidentally drowns a girl in a pond, and attacks Frankenstein's wife on their wedding night. This is one thing that bears similarity to the novel. In the novel, the monster kills the wife. At the end of the film, a crowd of angry villagers with burning torches hunt the monster down. Frankenstein confronts his own creation on the top of a hill. The monster drags him to the top of a windmill, and as the tension mounts, the villagers set fire to the windmill. Frankenstein's thrown off like a rag doll, violently hitting one of the sails on his way down. The windmill goes up in flames, and the monster seemingly burns to death. It's one hell of a finale, and must have had audiences in 1931 shitting their pants. It doesn't seem like Dr. Frankenstein would have physically survived, and appropriate that he was destroyed by his own creation. Yet there's a final scene where he's recovering in bed. This ending seems real tacked on if you ask me. When the film first came out, many scenes were cut because they were too shocking back then, such as Fritz torturing the monster. A close-up of a needle going into the monster was removed, even though it was important to the plot because the needle carried a tranquilizer. Then it would seem the monster collapses with no explanation. The censors didn't care if it made sense, they took their scissors to this film without mercy. The scene with the girl was considered too disturbing, so it got cut too, even though the monster doesn't drown the girl on purpose. He thinks that she'll float like one of the dandelions. Despite being excised, it became one of the most famous scenes and imitated in Young Frankenstein. Right after the famous line where Frankenstein says it's alive, he says, In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. The censors thought this was sacrilegious, so they removed part of the line. In the name of God, now I know what it Universal first released the restored version on VHS with all the missing bits intact, with the exception of the God line for some reason. But since then, on DVD, it's been fully restored. Since Universal had just completed Dracula, many of the same actors crossed over to Frankenstein. Edward Van Sloan, who played Dr. Van Helsing, is now playing Dr. Waldman. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. His acting is so similar, and playing another doctor on top of it makes it seem as if the same character had stepped out of one film into the next. He also gives a disclaimer at the very beginning, warning the audience that what they're about to see is really hardcore, which is pretty comical today. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we've warned you. Dwight Fry had played the crazy maniac Renfield in Dracula. Now he's playing Fritz. He's much less insane here, but still offers some nutty mannerisms. We don't really know much about his character's backstory. That's what makes him interesting. He's just some weird guy who helps Frankenstein. There's a part where he's going to answer the door, and he stops for a moment to fix a sock. I don't know why, but I find that really amusing. It's not a flub, there's nothing that defies logic about a character having to fix their sock, but it's also something you don't normally see happen. Naturally, fresh off the success of Dracula, Bela Lugosi was initially chosen for the role of the monster. There seems to be many contradicting stories as to why he didn't play the monster, the most common being that Lugosi refused the role because he didn't like the idea of having his face made unrecognizable through all the makeup and not having any dialogue. And that makes perfect sense. The kind of acting he established in Dracula is completely different than the monster. Other stories say it was director James Whale who wanted Boris Karloff instead. Either way, Whale was attracted to Karloff's face when he saw him in a movie called The Criminal Code. And I think he made a great choice. There's something about Karloff's face that makes him perfect for the monster. Even though Lugosi may have said the role wouldn't take much talent other than to just stagger around and grunt, there's something about Karloff's performance that just works. At the time, he wasn't famous. In fact, he wasn't even credited at the beginning of the movie, it's just a question mark. I believe the reasoning was to make the monster seem more mysterious, but at the end, they do reveal his name. Colin Clive is the real star, playing Frankenstein. He does a great job and really makes the role convincing. Everything he says seems like he believes it 100%. What makes a good mad scientist is that they come off mad to the other characters, but the audience sympathizes with them. We sympathize with Frankenstein. You never wanted to look beyond the clouds and the stars, or to know what causes the trees to bud, and what changes a darkness into light. But if you talk like that, people call you crazy. 
It may not be a perfect film, some of the acting is extremely exaggerated, like when Fritz is startled by a lab skeleton. The scenes that don't involve Frankenstein or the monster are kind of weak, and there are certain things that don't add up. Like why doesn't Frankenstein realize the brain he's putting into the monster is an abnormal one? Why does Fritz have an immediate hatred for the monster even though he helped Frankenstein all along without any worry? The rest of the film is nothing short of classic. It's the archetype of its kind. It's beautiful to look at from the cemetery scene to the laboratory to the hillside. The sound effects fill the atmosphere with constant dread. With the sounds of thunder and the yelling of villagers, you never notice the lack of music. Even if you haven't seen this movie, you may feel as if you have because of all the parodies and imitations. Go to the source, watch the one that started it all, and you'll see it lives up to what you'd expect. Bride of Frankenstein is one of the first horror sequels ever made, and still one of the best. Director James Whale returns and puts on it his stamp of quality. It gives the monster more personality, stays more true to the novel, and completes the story. It does have its tacky moments, like the opening prologue where Mary Shelley, played by Elsa Lanchester, is telling the story of Frankenstein as we recap the first movie leading up to the burning windmill. It's funny how they pretend that's exactly how Mary Shelley's story goes, when really it's nothing like it. But then she continues her story, and that's where Bride of Frankenstein picks up. A man accidentally falls into a water cave beneath the windmill and finds the monster is still alive. It's a creepy scene, and the monster's first appearance is a real doozy. He commits his first murder right away by strangling the man and then throwing his wife down for good measure. Brutal. This makes the monster seem real threatening and actually lives up to the word monster, but later on he becomes more sympathetic. After he climbs out, he scares the crap out of some other woman. Overacting at its finest, this old squawking crow is Una O'Connor, the same annoying bitch from another James Whale film, The Invisible Man. I have to say, the monster's makeup in this film is great. Props to Jack Pierce for his attention to detail. The monster actually looks like he's been through a fire. Some of his hair is burned away, revealing metal clamps that we never saw before. We assume Frankenstein would have used these to hold the skull together. As the movie goes on, the makeup gradually changes as if the monster's wounds are healing. I also like the fact that he never changes out of those old mangy clothes. There's no need to polish him up, just let him show all the abuse he's been through. Colin Clive is back as Dr. Frankenstein, but the wife is played by a different actress, Mae Clark in the original, Valerie Hobson in the sequel. Frankenstein no longer wants to pursue his experiments. He's learned his lesson and now wants to enjoy his time with his wife, who he neglected so much in the first movie. I've changed my mind. I won't do it. This makes way for a new mad scientist, Dr. Pretorius, played by Ernest Thessinger, who wants to work with Frankenstein. He steals the whole show very easily. He's like the devil on Frankenstein's shoulder, pestering him to create another monster. It's no wonder why Frankenstein refuses, but he's fascinated by Dr. Pretorius' own creations. Unlike Frankenstein, who took bodies from graves, Pretorius grew them, all tiny people in jars. The special effects here are amazing for 1935. It may even be the first movie to show tiny people, even before Dr. Cyclops and the Incredible Shrinking Man. Meanwhile, the monster is running around getting bothered and shot at everywhere he goes. He gets hung up kind of like Jesus Christ and brought to prison. You start to feel sorry for him pretty quickly. The monster escapes into the woods and finds a cabin where there lives an old blind man who he makes friends with. This is a very important scene because the man teaches the monster how to talk. And this is wine. To drink. 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 It's both funny and heartwarming. Good, good. This scene draws its basis from the novel and it's become famous and again parodied in Young Frankenstein. Tragedy happens when two wandering hunters happen to come across the cabin and find the monster. 
They could have left well enough alone, but instead they gotta burn the place down. What a couple of dumb shits. The monster storms into a cemetery and finds an underground crypt where Dr. Pretorius is drinking to a skull. He's one sick dude, you gotta love him. I especially like the way he reacts to seeing the monster. Oh. I thought I was alone. Good evening. That's what makes him so great. He's not afraid of anything. He proposes the idea to create a mate for the monster, and the monster likes it. Pretorius shows up at Frankenstein's door with the idea. When he refuses, Pretorius threatens him with the monster. Frankenstein is horrified seeing his own creation and is surprised to hear it talk. Frankenstein. Yes, there have been developments since he came to me. Pretorius implies here that he's the one who taught the monster how to speak. It's a lie, as if rubbing it in Frankenstein's face saying, yeah, I have more control over your creation than you do. It perfectly sums up what a cool and cocky sleazeball he is. When Frankenstein refuses again, they kidnap his wife and blackmail him until he has no choice. This is another big part of the novel, where the monster asks Frankenstein to make him a wife. In the novel, Frankenstein goes through with it until the last minute and destroys the creation. Then the monster gets pissed off and kills Frankenstein's own wife. But the movie's take on it is way different. The laboratory spectacle gets into high gear again, with lots of the same pieces of machinery as before. Both new ones, too. There's another assistant all of a sudden named Carl, played by Dwight Fry. He's the same actor that played the assistant Fritz in the first movie. Obviously they're not the same character because Fritz dies and Carl is not a hunchback. Why they would use the same actor to play the same type of character, I have no idea. What's funny here, the monster gets really impatient and throws Carl off the top of the castle. Whoa, that's ironic. Karloff throws Carl off. Dwight Fry's been killed by Dracula as well. I guess his characters just can't survive through a movie. <coughs> Poor Dwight Fry. Might as well call him Fright Die. Wow, I still have a month of monster madness ahead of me, and already I'm going cuckoo. The bride comes to life, looking like a mummy at first. Dr. Pretorius announces her as the Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride of Frankenstein. Of course, that's the title of the movie, but it doesn't make any sense because Frankenstein is not the monster's name. I guess he means of Frankenstein, as in the bride is created of Frankenstein? No, that doesn't make any sense either. You know, people have always been so confused since day one, thinking that Frankenstein is the monster. Universal would slap the name over the monster's face, on the trailers, and on the posters. And to top it all off, they pull off this shit saying the bride of Frankenstein. This is the reason the confusion never went away. There's also a short clip that exists of Boris Karloff playing chess with Bela Lugosi, and Lugosi calls Karloff Frankenstein. Ready for the test, Dracula? I'm ready, Frankenstein. The monster is not Frankenstein. I don't know what the deal is. Then they unwrap the bride's bandages and do up her hair. I never understood what the deal is with that weird hairdo. Regardless, the bride has become another famous monster, with the look being imitated constantly all around, in Halloween costumes and commercials, everywhere. I find that surprising, because the bride is only in the movie for a few minutes, and she never comes back in any of the sequels. Also, she doesn't do much other than jerk her head around like a bird, and never speaks other than some hisses and screams. She's played by Elsa Lanchester, the same actress who played Mary Shelley in the prologue but she's only credited for playing Mary Shelley. For The Bride, they just have a question mark, like they did with Karloff in the first movie. Except with Karloff, they reveal his name at the end, whereas The Bride, it's always a question mark. The Bride simply rejects the monster. She finds him frightening just like everyone else. The monster gently touches her arm, and for a moment you think it's gonna work out, but nope, she screams again, and the monster goes into plan B. He allows Frankenstein to leave the castle before pulling a self-destruct lever, destroying himself, the bride, Pretorius, and all that remains of the castle. It's a good ending, but my only problem with it is they needed a way for the castle to explode, so there just conveniently happens to be a lever that destroys it all. Why the hell would Frankenstein have a self-destruct lever, especially without any kind of safety lock? What if somebody hit it by accident? 
Anyway, for a 1930s movie, it's pretty sophisticated, with a dark sense of humor, lots of great camera angles, and a full musical score, whereas the first movie had hardly any music. Giving the monster dialogue and an emotional side really allows Boris Karloff a chance to shine. In many ways, Bride of Frankenstein surpasses the original. It's a masterpiece all the way. Fire is good. Fire, no good. Son of Frankenstein marks the beginning of a new cycle of universal monster movies. After Dracula's Daughter and the Invisible Ray in 1936, Universal stopped making horror films. Then, in 1938, they re-released Dracula and Frankenstein in theaters. It was a big success and proved that monster movies still meant big bucks. So Universal started up the monster engine once again. Of course, this is third in the Frankenstein series. Most horror series by now would be going way downhill. It seems like this would be the case here. Dr. Frankenstein is no longer in it, James Whale is no longer the director, the monster goes back to being a grumbling mute, there's hardly any continuity from the previous films, and there's no more Mary Shelley source material. It sounds like it would be a complete waste, but surprise, it's a first-rate chiller, top of the line. 1939 was a prestigious year for the film industry in general. Wizard of Oz, need I say more. The box office revenue was at a high, and because of this, the budgets got higher as well. Son of Frankenstein shows off some of this cinematic wealth with extravagant sets, a lavish score, and the longest runtime of any film in the Frankenstein series by far. Most of them were about an hour 15 minutes or so, this one is an hour and 40 minutes. Originally it was meant to be filmed in color, but record has it that Jack Pierce couldn't get the monster's makeup to look right in color, so they went back to black and white. The storyline is very simple. It takes place long after the events of the first two films. Frankenstein's son, Wolf Frankenstein, inherits his father's castle and moves in with his family. He's unwelcomed by the townspeople because of all the trouble his father's monster has caused. It's as if the whole family name is blacklisted. While checking out the remains of his father's laboratory, he meets Igor, who we've never seen before, but claims to be a former assistant of his father's. Igor is a mysterious undead fiend. Igor is dead! <laughs> who somehow survived being hanged as punishment for grave robbing. You'll see that. They hanged me once. Now he has a broken neck to show for it. Igor shows Wolf the monster who's been laying in a coma. Igor claims to have been a good friend of the monster and wants Wolf to revive him. Wolf decides to go through with it in hopes to tame the monster and restore honor to the name of Frankenstein. But Igor is the only one who can control the monster and uses him as a weapon of revenge to kill off the jurors who had him hanged. As the body count rises, the sly, wooden-armed Inspector Krogh comes to investigate, interrogating Wolf for much of the film. Eventually, Wolf becomes the hero, shooting Igor and drop-kicking the monster into a pit of burning sulfur, gaining the respect of the townspeople. On paper, this may have looked like an average, run-of-the-mill monster movie plot, but on screen, it's played with elegance and class. Is it the old legendary monster of my father's time? Or am I supposed to have whipped one up? Basil Rathbone is our star. He was also famous for playing Sherlock Holmes many times. He's really good as Wolf Frankenstein. He gives the character credibility. You can feel his obsession for his father's work and his ignorance to what the consequences will be. Igor is played by Bela Lugosi. It's definitely one of his best roles, on par with Dracula, or even better as some say. Outside, yes, he was hunting. You can see him as a ringleader of Universal Monsters, a crazy old shaggy beaten up lunatic who lives with the dead. This is place of the dead. We're all dead here. The monster is not a central character anymore, which doesn't give Boris Karloff as much to do, especially without any dialogue. But he still plays the part extremely well. His best moment is when we first see him walking about. There's a long, silent period where he stares down Wolf as if he recognizes the similarity with his father, even though he really doesn't look anything like Colin Clive, but that's beside the point. 
Then he sees himself in a mirror and starts behaving like a territorial animal. Then he slowly realizes it's his own reflection and isn't happy about it. Without any dialogue, you understand exactly what the monster is thinking. This was the last time Karloff played the monster, even though he played a scientist in other Frankenstein films like House of Frankenstein and Frankenstein 1970. He also wore the famous costume and makeup to a baseball game and in a Route 66 episode called A Lizard's Leg and an Owlet's Wing. His decision may have been based on the monster outliving his potential and in how physically demanding it was. He had to wear lead weights, heavy boots, and pounds of makeup. Just the way the monster and Igor are made for one another, so are Karloff and Lugosi. It's one of their best movies together. Lionel Atwill plays Inspector Krogh, again a stellar performance. He's a grey character, he doesn't hate Frankenstein like the townspeople, and he doesn't fully trust him either. He's the mediator between the two. In a creepy monologue, he explains the backstory of his wooden arm, that the monster had it torn off when he was a child. Billy, grab me by the arm. The way he tells it is genuinely bone-chilling, like the best of campfire ghost stories. This was another character spoofed in Young Frankenstein. It's been rumored that Dwight Fry is in there somewhere, probably as an extra part, like one of the villagers. Some speculate that his scene was deleted and that it was one of the pieces of color footage, but it hasn't been confirmed. The son of Son of Frankenstein is played by Donnie Dunnigan. Later on, he did the voice of Bambi, the young version. Butterfly! His acting is often criticized, and yeah, he's not very good, but I attest a lot of that to the time. You don't usually see child actors back then doing anything Oscar-worthy. Really, Daddy? Other than that elephant and tigers, I they believe that. Oh. You know who they should have gotten for the role? Gene Wilder. That would have been awesome. He would have been roughly the same age at the time, so it would have worked out perfectly. Of course, the reason I'm thinking about this is because Gene Wilder plays the same role in Young Frankenstein. He says he's the grandson. So in other words, that kid is Young Frankenstein. Don't try too hard to connect this movie's storyline with the first two. It almost completely ignores any continuity. Since when did the townspeople start hating Frankenstein? This wasn't apparent in the first two movies in any way. Why is there no mention of the bride? If the monster survived the explosion, why not her too? If the laboratory exploded, why is it standing again? Why does it look so different? Why doesn't the monster speak anymore? Who is Igor? When did he ever help Frankenstein? He wasn't the same character as Fritz. Or wait, maybe he was. Let's think about this. In the first Frankenstein, Fritz was hanged by the monster, but we never see what happened. Maybe it wasn't the monster. Maybe in the amount of time that elapsed since Frankenstein heard the scream and ran to the room, the jury came in, had a trial, and hanged Fritz before changing his name to Igor. Yeah, there you go. You can say this movie is a reboot, or just take into account that lots of time has passed since the last two films. Igor says nothing about the explosion, he says the monster was hit by a bolt of lightning. Also, Krogh's story about how he lost his arm to the monster obviously never happened in the first two movies. And also, Wolf finds two bullets in the monster's heart. Even though he had been shot at many times in Bride, he was never explicitly shot anywhere in the chest area. We can assume that happened during Krogh's backstory. So, really, there is a whole episode of the monster that passed, which could have been its own movie. It almost makes you wish there was a lost Frankenstein film that segues between Bride and Son. To sum things up, if you're expecting the monster to be the central character, you'll be disappointed to see him diminished as being Igor's tool. It's the rest of the characters that make it so absorbing. It's all about the three-way battle of wits between Igor, Wolf, and Krogh. It's leisurely paced and takes its characters seriously, giving them plenty of time to play off each other. The actors never stand in one place. They move around, throw darts, and do other stage business. The first time I saw it, I thought it was a good sequel, but not as good as the first two. Over the years, it's grown on me, and now it's the one I enjoy watching the most often. It gets better every time, and it's gotten to the point where I think it may even be the best of the bunch. He's alive! <laughs> Monster Madness! <laughs>
Ghost of Frankenstein picks up right where the last movie left off. The same way Frankenstein and Bride go together, so do Son and Ghost. Wolf Frankenstein and his family had moved out of the Frankenstein castle and left it abandoned. The villagers still see it as an object of bad omen, so they rush to destroy it. Typically, this is how one of these movies would end, so it really starts off fast. Igor still lives in the castle and tries to fend the people off. It's not explained how he survived the bullets from the last movie, but we can assume if he can survive being hanged, he can probably survive being shot too. He's immortal. The castle is blown up till there's nothing left. The explosions free the monster from the hardened sulfur and the two escape into the night. Hey, I never noticed the gravestone falling down. There's some inconsistency here as the monster is wearing different clothing than before. He's back to his traditional outfit rather than that fur coat he had on his son. Then the monster gets struck by lightning, which supposedly makes him stronger. This contradicts the last movie where, according to Igor's account, lightning put the monster in a coma. That was why he was lying on the table for half the film. Well, now it makes him stronger? That does make sense because the lightning is what brought the monster to life in the first place. But all these different screenwriters can never agree on one thing. The lightning. It is good for you. Igor gets the idea to go to Ludwig, the second son of Frankenstein, to get him to harness the powers of electricity to strengthen the monster, or something like that. Ludwig is the first Frankenstein to have the good sense to refuse getting involved with the monster, because of all the trouble it's caused his father and brother. With or without Ludwig's help, the monster goes on a rampage through the town. He's captured by the police once, but gets loose and breaks into Ludwig's house at night, scaring the crap out of his daughter and killing his assistant, Dr. Kettering. Ludwig manages to gas the monster to sleep, and then plans on dissecting the monster, destroying him once and for all. It was made limb by limb, organ by organ. It must be unmade in the same way. He changes his mind when the ghost of his father comes and gives him the idea to give the monster a new brain, because that was the whole problem from the beginning, the abnormal brain. So Ludwig decides to go through with it, but Igor has other plans. My brain will be your brains. While Ludwig is planning to put the brain of Dr. Kettering into the monster's skull, Igor sees to it that it's his own brain instead. He makes a deal with another doctor, Bomer, to swap his brain without Ludwig knowing. His promise to Bomar is that they would rule the world together. How exactly you can rule the world in a monster's body, I am not sure because you see earlier on the monster can't even fight off a group of police officers. As the finale unfolds, the Igor monster awakes and boasts with power. I have the strength of a hundred men. I cannot die. I cannot be destroyed. I, Igor, will live forever. It's really freaky hearing Igor's voice come out of the monster and is my favorite part of the film. Soon the monster goes blind. As Ludwig explains, Igor's blood type is different than the monster and it doesn't feed the sensory nerves, whatever that means. Well, the monster is now blind and angry, throwing Dr. Bomar onto some electrical gear which explodes and sets the whole house on fire. The monster staggers about as everything but the kitchen sink explodes for no reason. You actually see his flesh peeling off, which is pretty nifty. The roof collapses, almost immediately the end credits roll, and you sit there thinking, what the hell did I just watch? This is the first Frankenstein movie without Boris Karloff. The monster is played by Lon Chaney Jr. He was fresh off of success as the Wolfman, so naturally the studio starred using him for every one of their monster roles, even if he wasn't right for the part. He played the mummy and even Count Alucard. His performance as the monster is just as good as playing a rock. He lacks expression and doesn't make one sound. Maybe it's because the monster is supposed to be weak and needs his dose of electricity from Frankenstein. Only when he becomes the Igor monster does he get interesting. I am Igor. Dwight Fry is back again as a villager. Destroy the castle. Wipe the last traces of these accursed Frankensteins from our land. And Lionel Atwell's back as Dr. Bomer. They sure do recycle their actors a lot. Sir Cedric Hardwick is both Ludwig Frankenstein and the ghost of Henry Frankenstein. A shame it wasn't Colin Clive. Evelyn Ankers is Ludwig's daughter, who is also Lon Chaney's love interest in The Wolfman. Bela Lugosi is Igor again, obviously. He's still pretty good, but not quite as creepy as he was in Son. 
Ghost of Frankenstein is a step below its predecessors in terms of quality, but the fun factor is put on max. The brain transplant idea is really cool. There's lots of action and familiar music cues lifted from the Wolfman. It's entertaining as hell, and we all know hell is pretty damn entertaining. The Wolfman and the Frankenstein monster together in one film, need I say more. This is the first monster brawl, before King Kong vs. Godzilla, before Alien vs. Predator or Freddy vs. Jason. This was the first Universal monster movie I ever saw. It got me hooked, so I'd say it's a good one to start with. It opens with a spectacular cemetery scene where two grave robbers seek out the tomb of Larry Talbot, the Wolfman. The camera pans to the right, showing off the full scope of this awesome set. They break into the crypt and open the coffin. Unfortunately, they chose the night of a full moon to do it, and apparently the moonlight on Larry's corpse is all it takes to bring him back to life. Larry's body is discovered in the streets, and he's brought to a hospital. He tries to explain to the doctors that he turns into a werewolf on each full moon, but they think he's out of his mind. There's a curse upon me. I change into a wolf. As a sequel to The Wolfman, it's quite good. You see things you never saw in the first movie, like a shot of the full moon, believe it or not, and a close-up of Larry's face turning into the Wolfman. I think the appeal of this effect is knowing how it was done, that Lon Chaney Jr. had to lie still for hours and hours while the makeup was gradually applied. There's also a really creepy moment where the Wolfman stalks a police officer. Larry goes to see Maliva, the gypsy woman from the first movie, played by Maria Uspenskaya. He asks for her help because he's tired of suffering through his werewolfism. He wants to die again and rest in peace. She tells him that there's a man who can help him, so they go out on a journey to find, guess who, Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein? Don't mention that name around this town. Supposedly, Frankenstein holds the secrets of death and can help Larry die. But really, all he has to do is get killed by something silver again, right? Couldn't he just ask Maliva to do it for him and cremate him this time? Well, it doesn't matter anyway, because they find out Frankenstein is dead. The townspeople don't clarify if this is supposed to be Ludwig Frankenstein from the previous film, or if they're talking about the original Henry Frankenstein. All they said is that Frankenstein and the monster died when the castle burned to the ground. Well, that sounds like what happened in the last movie, but what's the deal with the castle? Isn't that the same castle that was destroyed at the beginning of Ghost of Frankenstein? They blew that thing up! Now it's perfectly standing again? Not to mention, the ending of Ghost of Frankenstein took place in the doctor's house. It's the house that burned down, not a castle. The final straw to this mess is when Larry actually finds the monster. Buried in ice! The monster went from fire to fucking ice! You can't get any more opposite than that. I would just say this movie's another reboot, but there is some continuity, or at least there was. Because originally, the monster had a voice and explained that Igor's brain was put into his body and then he went blind, which is exactly what happened in the last movie. But the monster's dialogue was cut, so now there's no explanation that he's blind, you see him staggering all around with his arms out for no apparent reason, and there's some moments where you can still see the monster's mouth moving. I should mention here that the monster is played by Bela Lugosi, ironic that he was considered for the role in the first Frankenstein. The common story is that Lugosi turned the role down originally, and since then he's regretted it, so this was like his second chance. Everyone's criticized his performance, but the reason it's so awkward is because he's supposed to be blind. No! No, it's me! Today, when people imitate the monster, they outstretch their arms like that without even realizing it's the Lugosi monster they're imitating. How about that? When people imitate Dracula, it's always the Lugosi Dracula, so it all comes back to Lugosi. Supposedly, the reason for cutting the monster's dialogue was that the studio executives didn't like Lugosi's voice. When they were screening dailies, everyone laughed at hearing the monster speak with a Hungarian accent. 
I find that hard to believe. At the end of Ghost of Frankenstein, when Igor's brain is in the monster, isn't that Lugosi's voice? I, Igor, will live forever! Nobody laughed then, and if they did, they wouldn't be laughing anymore now. Also, if the voice was that hysterical, couldn't they just dub over it with someone else's voice? The same way they dubbed Lugosi's voice over Cheney's. According to the original script, the dialogue was extremely confusing. The monster spoke as if he had a split personality, saying things like, Dr. Frankenstein created this body to be immortal, and his son gave me a new brain. So is it Igor speaking, or is it the monster? If the original dialogue really sounded that mixed up, then cutting it was for the best. Wouldn't it be great if these lost scenes were found? It's a shame that Universal threw them away. Obviously, back then, no one was thinking about DVD extras. Another thing worth mentioning is the title. It's clear that in the trailer and on the posters, they are most definitely calling the monster Frankenstein. But I do have a theory. Larry meets Frankenstein's daughter, Elsa. She is a Frankenstein, and Larry is the Wolfman. So there you go, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. By the way, is she supposed to be the daughter of the original Frankenstein or the daughter of Ludwig Frankenstein? It seems as if we're leaning towards Ludwig because of that story about him perishing with the monster when his house or castle burned down. That would make her the same character in Ghost of Frankenstein who was played by Evelyn Ankers, but Evelyn Ankers was also in The Wolfman and since this movie is also a sequel to The Wolfman, maybe that's why she couldn't be the same actress. Actually, never mind, it wouldn't have mattered. They recycle actors more than a kindergarten play. It's the fourth Frankenstein movie to have Dwight Fry. He said he'd blow up the dam. It's the third to have Lionel Atwill, who was an inspector, a scientist, and now he's a mayor. Tom Stevenson, the gravedigger who was killed in The Wolfman, is now a grave robber. Lugosi played a character named Bela in The Wolfman, the werewolf that bit Larry Talbot. Of course, he was also Igor, and now he's the monster. Then there's Doris Lloyd and Patrick Knowles, who were in The Wolfman, and now they're the nurse and doctor. I attest a lot of this shameless recycling and lack of continuity to the fact that there was no such thing as home video. Audiences didn't have the chance to rewatch movies to freshen their memories. It could be years between each sequel, but actually I take it back because these movies were coming out rather quickly. But whatever the case, they didn't care as much about continuity as we do today. It's not even clear what time period these movies are supposed to take place. The Wolfman seems like it was set in the present day because there were cars. This one claims to take place four years after The Wolfman, but they're back to horse and buggies and there's a big song and dance scene that looks like something from older times. Tonight we toast our happy host. Ba -da -da -ba -da -da. I do have to comment that this is one of those scenes you either love or hate. I'm really sorry to admit, I think I love it. There's something about it that tickles my funny bone. I guess because it's so unnecessary. The whole movie just takes a break. Time to raise your beer glasses. Okay, where the hell am I now? Oh, oh yeah, all right. Larry's doctor from the hospital catches up with him, and would you know, his name happens to be Dr. Frank. Couldn't they come up with a name that sounded a little different than you know who? Well, he agrees to help Larry die, so they go into Frankenstein's old dusty laboratory and strap both Larry and the monster to operating tables. Using Frankenstein's notes, they plan on draining the life energy from both of them. But all in the flash of a second, the Frankenstein curse hits him and Dr. Frank gets power hungry and wants to see the monster at full strength. I've got to see it at its full power. So literally, Dr. Frank becomes the Frank in Stein of the film. He's punished almost instantly as the monster breaks loose and throws him around. Frank really fucked up because he had to wait till the last possible minute when the full moon was rising. So now he's got two monsters to deal with. Just as the monster carries off Elsa, the Wolfman attacks the monster, the two of them start fighting, and movie history is made. The monster is much stronger, but the Wolfman is more agile. I like how they balance their skills. Most of what you see here of the monster is played by a stunt double. I wonder how little you actually see of 60-year-old Bela Lugosi. The villagers use dynamite to blow up a dam, flooding and destroying the castle. The two monsters perish instantly. So, really? The whole movie has been a suicide quest for Larry Talbot, and all he had to do was drown? Or was it the castle falling on them? Who knows? 
I think they could have come up with a better way to kill the monsters, but nevertheless, it's a thrilling ending and is an enjoyable monster flick all the way around. The logic is a complete mess, but that only makes it more fun to talk about. The first half, which focuses on the Wolfman, holds itself together much better. After he meets the monster, it goes downhill, until the climax when things get awesome. The opening cemetery scene and the final battle are the two highlights which bookend what is an imperfect but entertaining film. House of Frankenstein, now we're talking. This is the first movie to not only team up Frankenstein's monster and the Wolfman, but Dracula too. These are the big three. You see these monsters' likenesses grouped together constantly. In the Munsters, Groovy Ghoulies, the Drac Pack, the Monster Squad TV series, the Monster Squad movie, but this is the monster mash that started it all. The only thing disappointing is that none of the monsters share the same screen time. Dracula is only in the beginning, Frankenstein's monster only comes alive at the end, and the rest is all about the Wolfman. The main running theme in the Frankenstein films is that there's always some kind of doctor who follows in Frankenstein's experiments. There is Dr. Pretorius, Wolf Frankenstein, Ludwig Frankenstein, Dr. Frank Mannering, and now Dr. Niemann, played by Boris Karloff. The film opens in a jail cell where Neiman and his hunchbacked assistant Daniel are talking about the idea of brain transplanting. Now this brain is taken from the man and transplanted into the skull of the dog. Wait a minute, put a human brain into the skull of a dog? Would that fit? And when did Frankenstein ever do interspecies brain transplanting? Whatever the case, they never mention this again for the rest of the movie. Niemann says his brother worked with Frankenstein and passed on his secrets to him. Now, hang on, who was his brother? Could it have been Fritz, Carl, Igor, or maybe even Dr. Pretorius? Who knows? A random bolt of lightning makes the prison explode all of a sudden, conveniently allowing Niemann and Daniel to escape. They meet up with a guy named Lampini who runs a traveling sideshow exhibit featuring the original skeleton of Count Dracula. One glaring bit of inconsistency here is that Lampini says he found the skeleton in Transylvania. From the cellar of Dracula's castle in the Carpathian Mountains. We all know Dracula moved to England and that's where he was killed by Van Helsing. Only in the novel does Dracula flee back to Transylvania where he's killed by Quincy Morris and Jonathan Harker. I'd say they were counting the novel as canon, but that's not true either because they say Dracula was killed with a wooden stake whereas in the novel, it was by knives. I guess they couldn't make up their minds if they wanted to follow the book or the movie. Niemann orders Daniel to kill Lampini and takes over his exhibit. No, Niemann doesn't have any real interest in parading Dracula around, he just wants to use it as a cover-up to hide from the police. But when he pulls the stake from Dracula's skeleton, Dracula comes alive again. If that's all it takes, I guess you can say Dracula is truly immortal. What would have happened if the stake fell out by accident, or if it rotted away after many years? Or when the skeleton turns to dust, could he still come back? Maybe I'm thinking about it too hard. Well, if you were waiting for Bela Lugosi to appear, you're wrong. I remember how disappointed I was as a kid. Get used to it, Dracula is played by John Carradine, a good actor who I've come to appreciate over the years. But he doesn't have the same magnetic presence that Lugosi had, nor is he as charming and exotic. He plays the part well, but it's nothing too special. Though to be fair, he doesn't get a whole lot of time. Dracula is a slave to Nemon in exchange for keeping his coffin safe. I will do whatever you wish. Which really underplays Dracula's power. Nemon uses Dracula as a tool of revenge, killing the police officers who sent him to jail, very much the same way as Son of Frankenstein, where Igor used the monster to kill the jurors who had him hanged. Lionel Atwill is in there again as another inspector, his fourth Frankenstein movie in a row. I like how the main characters are out just to have fun. They go to the Chamber of Horrors, they take a walk through the fog, they hitch a carriage ride with some stranger who happens to be Dracula, then they stop somewhere to sit down and have some wine. They just go with the flow like dorm hopping college students. They set the template for future slasher films. 
Dracula is killed only 25 minutes in. Dracula is on the run from the cops and is trying to catch up with Nemo and Daniel who are still using Lampini's horror wagon. They have Dracula's coffin and they don't want the cops after them too, so Nemon's decision is to dump the coffin, leaving Dracula scrambling to reach it before the sun rises. But it's too late and Dracula's turned once again to bones. This ends the Dracula story and never again do we see any of the other characters, except for Nemon and Daniel. It's like a short film before the main feature. Nemon and Daniel travel to Frankenstein's town and on their way witness a dancing gypsy girl named Ilana who Daniel takes an immediate liking to. Her boss takes all her money and beats her. Daniel comes to the rescue and puts him in his place. They take Ilana along for the ride. She's very friendly with Daniel but is shocked at first sight of his deformity. It's a legitimately heartbreaking scene. This little love story going on here between Daniel and Ilana is just like Quasimodo and the gypsy girl Esmeralda in Hunchback of Notre Dame. Daniel swings around like a monkey, similar to the athletic nature of the original Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1923, starring Lon Chaney Sr. It's as if they were trying to throw in another famous monster here as a bonus. Daniel is played by J. Carol Nash. Both him and Lon Chaney Jr. teamed up again in the 1971 shit fest Dracula vs. Frankenstein. Fate would have it, it was the last film for both of them. Nemon explores the remains of the Frankenstein castle and finds the body of the Wolfman and the monster frozen in ice. He thaws them out. The monster is still in a dormant stage, but the Wolfman, Larry Talbot, is alive and pissed off. Why have you freed me from the ice that imprisoned the beast that lived within me? Why? He wants peace from his werewolfism which he can only find in death, but Nemon promises him that he can cure him by transplanting his brain into another body. He's made the same promise to Daniel who no longer wants to be a hunchback, something he's promised him since the opening jail scene. If I had Frankenstein's records to guide me, I could give you a perfect body. So now he's got two promises to fulfill, but instead focuses his attention on trying to revive the monster and playing a big game of brain swapping. He kidnaps two of his former assistants, Ullman and Strauss, who betrayed him. He plans to put Ullman's brain into the skull of the monster and the brain of the Wolfman into Strauss. According to Nemon, that will make him turn into the Wolfman. So the werewolfism is a disease of the brain. Okay, fine, I can go with that. But he acts as if Strauss would be aware of this happening. No, it would only give Larry Talbot another body to become the Wolfman. It doesn't solve anything for Larry. And what the hell does he plan to do with Strauss's brain? Then he wants to put the monster's brain into Larry's body. What good does that do? It's just like combining the Wolfman and the Frankenstein monster into one. Wolfenstein. Well, we got a love triangle going on here. Ilana is no longer paying any attention to Daniel. Now, she likes Larry. Because I like you. What a whore. Poor Daniel. It's all because he has a hump on his back. He wants Nemon to put his brain in Larry's body, but instead, Nemon is committed to having the monster's brain go in there, for whatever reason. Daniel tries to warn Ilana that Larry is a werewolf, and she yells at him because she thinks he's jealous. He's a werewolf. No, I don't believe you. You're making it all up because you're jealous. I hate you. You're mean and you're ugly. I hate you. I hate you. That's harsh. I hate you and you're ugly? There's nothing worse you can say to somebody. Daniel takes out his frustration on the lifeless monster, unaware that he is conscious. We all know where this is going. Well, Ilana actually does believe Daniel, and she sympathizes with Larry's werewolf problem. Well then, why did she have to yell at him? She hates the poor guy just because he's a hunchback, but she likes Larry even though he's a werewolf and could possibly kill her. It's just because he's more handsome. What a fucking bitch. I can't wait to see the wolfman tear out her goddamn throat. Oh yeah, it's happening. Here we go. Larry becomes the wolfman in the most well-done transformation scene yet. It all builds up to an exciting finale where every one of the main characters is killed off in a row. The Wolfman attacks Ilana just as she shoots him with a silver bullet and they both die together. Daniel mourns her death and blames Nemon. 
Just as Nimon's finally bringing the monster to life, Daniel decides he's had enough and his boss can go to hell. We only see what Daniel does to Nimon in shadow as the monster unstraps itself from the table. It's a great shot that leaves what happens to our imagination. The monster gets up, picks up Daniel, and throws him through a window where he falls to his death. The scream is actually recycled from Karloff in Son of Frankenstein. The monster picks up the crippled body of Nemon, and in this one instance, both look each other in the face. It's as if Boris Karloff and the monster are sharing a special bond, fitting that he was the one who first gave life to the role. It's a wonderful little beat. It's interesting to see him in the role of the doctor this time. The monster is played by Glenn Strange, an appropriate name, and he ends up playing the monster in all the movies from here on out making him and Karloff the only actors to play the monster in three consecutive movies. The villagers all show up with their burning torches, as usual. They didn't waste any time, did they? The monster's only been alive for a few minutes. Those villagers, man, they're pros by now. They don't take this monster shit. The monster carries Nemon's body out into the swamp and sinks into quicksand. Karloff, who's had enough of getting his face covered in monster makeup, is now getting covered in mud. And then without pissing away any of the momentum, the movie ends. It's great. For a movie that tries to juggle a bunch of monsters, it's quite good at telling its story. All the characters have wants and desires, with Dr. Nemon being in the center of it all. He's such a great villain because he breaks his promises with everyone, Larry, Daniel, and even Dracula. I would have liked to see him double cross other universal monsters. How about he poses as an Egyptian museum curator and resurrects the mummy? Then, when he doesn't need the mummy anymore, he pulls off his bandages. What if it was the invisible man? He'd somehow make him turn visible right at the worst possible time. This is the kind of villain that only good old Boris can pull off with such class. I also like the way all the monsters are legitimately killed and in their most appropriate ways. Sunlight for Dracula, a silver bullet for the Wolfman, and Nemon dies together with the monster. The monster and Karloff are one. It's well fitting and could have been the perfect way to end the series. House of Frankenstein was a fitting closure to Universal's monster legacy and brought finality to Dracula, the Wolfman, and the Frankenstein monster. But Universal couldn't leave it alone. The following year, they rushed out House of Dracula, which more or less rehashes the previous films. It's an unnecessary sequel, plain and simple. But for us monster lovers, we'll take it. It stars the three famous monsters again, which makes this the first of the Frankenstein films to not have Frankenstein in the title. And technically, Dracula doesn't have a house in it either, but whatever. The film opens with Dracula, again played by John Carradine, entering the home of a doctor. It's a quiet and steady build-up, and effectively creepy. Dracula approaches the doctor, Dr. Edelman, and asks for, get this, a cure for his vampirism. You could affect a cure. There might be a way. Yes, apparently Dracula is bored of blood-sucking and not being able to go out in daylight. He wants a cure. As absurd as that sounds, the doctor agrees because it would be a challenge to medical science. While Edelman's busy talking to Dracula, the friggin' Wolfman shows up too. It's never explained how either of them came back to life. We last saw Dracula turn to bones and the Wolfman shot with a silver bullet, but never, not once, are these incidents ever mentioned. So despite parading itself as a follow-up to the last movie, it's really just another reboot. The only thing that is consistent is that Larry Talbot is tired of being the Wolfman, but this time, rather than trying to die, he's hoping the doctor can cure him. He's in a hurry, too, because the full moon is rising. Basically, the secretary has to tell him, Sorry, Wolfman, the doctor's busy with Dracula at the moment. What is he, the monster doctor? Larry runs out in a panic, goes to the police, and requests to have himself locked in a jail cell. Edelman shows up and, wait a minute, that police officer. 
Is that Lionel Atwill again? Will that guy ever go away? Anyway, this is a hilarious scene because nobody believes that Larry's a werewolf. There's no such thing as a werewolf. It's a belief that exists only in your mind. They all go through the usual routine of telling him that it's only in his mind, but this is a rare moment when he actually becomes the Wolfman right in front of their faces. That shut them up. Typically, Larry would spend half the movie trying to convince everyone, but here, it's done and over with. The Dracula plotline hits the brakes, and the movie becomes all about the Wolfman for a while. Edelman decides he's going to work on curing Larry, and actually explains how his werewolfism works. Pressure upon certain parts of the brain. When this happens, the glands generate an abnormal supply of certain hormones. In your case, those which bring about the physical transformation which you experience. That's a serious problem I have with this movie. The werewolf transformation should have been kept supernatural instead of giving it a scientific explanation. Well, it's full moon time, so Larry runs off again. He dives into the ocean and gets washed into a cave. Eelman goes after him and gets attacked by the wolfman just as the full moon descends. Lucky for him. Then guess what? They find Frankenstein's monster in the mud along with the skeleton of Dr. Niemann. Whoa, hold on here. Up until now, the last movie's been ignored. They don't follow up on what happened to Dracula or the Wolfman, but now they're following up on the monster? So this is like a half reboot, half sequel? Anyway, now Edelman's really got his hands full. He's got Dracula, the Wolfman, and now the Frankenstein monster laying on his table. Like every other scientist, he wants to revive the monster, but for the meantime, he decides against it. One thing I don't understand is why Edelman was familiar with Dracula and the Frankenstein monster, but he didn't believe Larry would turn into a werewolf. Whatever. By the way, Edelman has two female assistants. One of them is a hunchback and has almost nothing to do with the plot. The other is a subtle love interest to Larry, which comes off at pure random. Also, Dracula takes a liking to her, and that's when things take a turning point, because now he wants to remain a vampire. It's my impression that this was Dracula's plan all along, just to get into the doctor's house, since the very first scene shows him staring through a window at the assistant. Edelman is giving Dracula a blood transfusion, which I guess is supposed to make him stop being a vampire, but Dracula reverses the flow of the transfusion and contaminates Edelman. What happens to Edelman isn't exactly clear. At first it's implied that he becomes a vampire, because you can see he has no reflection. But instead, he turns into some kind of Jekyll and Hyde character. He switches between good and evil at random. He becomes the main monster of the movie. In fact, for a while, he's the only monster. He kills Dracula by opening his coffin, exposing him to sunlight. How anticlimactic is that? Dracula doesn't even have a chance to wake up and realize what's happening. At least he lasted a bit longer than he did in House of Frankenstein. As for the Wolfman, Edelman performs a surgical operation on his brain and cures him, and the Frankenstein monster is still lying on the table. So for now, all we have is the mad Edelman running around terrorizing people. The good news is that he's really fun to watch. There's a very creepy moment where he scares a coach driver, and you're kept in suspense waiting for him to kill the guy. What's the matter, Zigfried? You act as though you were afraid. Oh no, sir. Why should I be afraid? Of the night, perhaps? I'm not afraid of the night. Your hands are trembling, Siegfried. Had it not been for the overacting of the coach driver, this would be one of the most effective scenes in the whole Universal catalog. See, you are afraid of me. You're driving faster and faster so that you can get into the village and tell the police. It could have been as suspenseful as the scene with the madman's soul in the old dark house. After he kills the driver, he's chased by the villagers through the town. It heavily borrows from the scene in Nosferatu, where Renfield is being chased. The way they both climb on their roofs draws a strong comparison. The shot of Edelman's shadow growing larger is reminiscent of German Expressionist photography. In the end, Larry steps out into the light of the full moon and confirms that he is no longer a werewolf. I have to say, I really like the silver bullet better. Having him cured is a disappointing way to end the Wolfman. But on the other hand, it's nice to see a happy ending after all he's suffered through. With only a few minutes left of the film, Edelman finally revives the Frankenstein monster and everything is wrapped up faster than you can say what the shit. 
Larry shoots Edelman, and the monster staggers about destroying the lab. Stuff explodes and catches fire, and next thing you know, you're watching the same ending from Ghost of Frankenstein. Literally, they recycled the same footage, one of Universal's cheapest and shameless moments. So, the monster burns to death again, and that's the end. House of Dracula does have its good moments, like all those creepy shots involving shadows, but the plot is uninspired, the ending is a complete letdown, and all three monsters get shortchanged. It is by far, without any doubt, the weakest entry in the series. In the early 1940s, Universal was coming out with a Frankenstein movie almost every year. By the mid-40s, they ran out of steam, and audience didn't find the monsters as scary anymore compared to the real horrors of World War II. So comedians Bud Abbott and Lou Costello gave them a reason for one more outing. Many don't consider this part of the official Frankenstein series because it's a comedy, but I say screw it, I'll include this anyway. The title has a good ring, but is a little odd. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Well, they meet the Wolfman, Dracula, and the Frankenstein monster, but there is no Dr. Frankenstein anywhere in the film. So they are very explicitly calling the monster by the name that he's been so misidentified with. In the movie, they call him Frankenstein's monster, or the Frankenstein monster, but it's Costello who adds to the mix-up by calling him Frankie. Frankie? Don't him do it to you, Frankie boy. Listen to me, Frankie. So what is this? The monster is not... You know what? Fuck it. It's Frankenstein. Ab and Costello play Chick and Wilbur, two baggage clerks who are responsible for transporting the bodies of Dracula and Frankenstein to a Chamber of Horrors exhibit. Dracula wakes up, hypnotizes Wilbur, and revives Frankenstein. Yeah, I'm calling him Frankenstein now. If you can't beat him, join him. Dracula's played by Bela Lugosi for his second and only other time in the movies. It's true that he played Dracula on stage several times. He played Dracula in a short newsreel clip called Hollywood on Parade, where he meets Betty Boop. You have booped your last boop. And in a 1950s TV show, You Asked For It. He played other vampires in Mark of the Vampire and Return of the Vampire. But other than that, there were no more Dracula movies featuring Lugosi, so this marked his one and only comeback to the role. Unlike the first Dracula, here you actually see him turn into a bat, with cartoon animation done by the creator of Woody Woodpecker, Walter Lanz, whose studio also did the opening cartoon credit sequence. The rule that a vampire casts no reflection in a mirror is ignored here. Everyone regards this as a flub, but it's way too obvious. I think it's just because they didn't establish the lore here. In this movie, he does cast a reflection. The plot is nothing new. It's the same old brain swapping game. Dracula wants to put Wilbur's brain into Frankenstein with the help of his female assistant who pretends to be Wilbur's girlfriend. Why the hell they want to do this, I have no idea. You want to take my brain and put it in Junior's body? Yeah. <laughs> For a minute, I didn't know how you were going to do it. <gasps> Larry Talbot shows up and says he's been following the monsters from Europe and that he needs Chick and Wilbur's help to put a stop to them. Chick doesn't believe in monsters and thinks he's crazy. You're crazy, and so is this screwball. Furthermore, Larry tries to warn them that he turns into a werewolf on every full moon. Needless to say, we aren't following any continuity here. There's no mention of his cure from House of Dracula. Lon Chaney Jr. plays the part with the same level of seriousness as before, and seeing him clash with the comedic joking nature of Costello is a hilarious contrast. In a half an hour, the moon will rise and I'll turn into a wolf. You and 20 million other guys. Listen, I might tear you limb from limb. I like how the monsters don't try to be funny. They don't act any different than they normally would, so they're the straight men to the comedy. It all clicks together perfectly. A lot of the comedy stems from ignorance. There's a scene where Wilbur is in a hotel room being stalked by the Wolfman, and he has no clue. Then there's all these scenes where Wilbur is trying to convince Chick that he's seeing monsters, but Chick never believes him. Well, where are they? They must have 
must be in there. Oh, stop. It's not their funniest movie, not even close. Abbott and Costello are at their best when they're exchanging fast, witty dialogue. But here, with all the monsters and everything going on, there's not a whole lot of room for them to play around. He can't get in the finale is lots of fun. Wilbur's strapped to a table while all hell breaks loose around him. The monster goes berserk, and the Wolfman and Dracula fight. The way the monsters are killed is a complete joke. The Wolfman and Dracula fall into the water, which is no different to when Larry dove into the water in House of Dracula. As for Frankenstein, he walks onto a burning dock, and for the first time in his life, he doesn't seem to be afraid of fire, and then he falls through the dock about two feet into the water. Nice conclusion. The monster's last movie, and that's how they all die. I read a fact on Wikipedia, and I use the word fact very loosely, but supposedly the Australian film censors required every scene involving a monster to be removed. I guess that version's known as Abbott and Costello meet nothing. The Invisible Man makes a last minute cameo, voiced by Vincent Price. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the Invisible Man. <laughs> this opened the door for the boys to meet more monsters. There is Abbott and Costello meet the killer Boris Karloff. Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which features Karloff as the title role, and features the Frankenstein monster, at least a mechanical version. And then there's my favorite, Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. There's a lot more breathing time for Bud and Lou to go over their sketch gags, and there's a really funny scene where Lou has a boxing match with the Invisible Man in the ring helping him out. It's comedic gold. There's also Abbott and Costello meet the mummy, and a short film where they meet the creature from the Black Lagoon. Well, this concludes my in-depth look at the Frankenstein series. Check in tomorrow. I'm going to jump ahead and take a look at another series. Are you trying to tell me that candle moves? Look, wait a minute. Candles can't move. <laughs>
think about it, a Dracula movie without Renfield? Even the 1922 version, Nosferatu, had Renfield. I never even heard the name before. Even though it excludes some of the popular Dracula traditions, it still comes out strong. The sets are amazing, from the castle interior to the foggy cemetery. It's much more elaborate than any Dracula film before. Director Terence Fisher would become one of the all-time great horror directors. Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee became the new hot horror actors and were paired in several upcoming Hammer classics. They were the new Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Peter Cushing is probably the best Van Helsing ever. He plays the part with conviction and class. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. I believe every word that comes out his mouth. He wants to get his damn vampire, and nothing's gonna stop him. Christopher Lee plays Dracula with a dual personality. At first, he's a kind and gentle host. Count Dracula, I am Dracula, and I welcome you to my house. Then the switch goes off, and he's a rabid, blood-drooling beast of the night. Michael Goff is also very good as Arthur Holmwood, who goes through a transition. First, he's a skeptic to the supernatural, then he becomes slowly convinced by Van Helsing. The final confrontation between Van Helsing and Dracula is one of the most classic and iconic fights between good and evil ever put on film. Van Helsing pulls down the window shade and Dracula is destroyed by sunlight. We get the privilege of seeing his body actually decay, something that would usually be considered too gruesome for the 50s. In fact, Hammer had a long fight with the censors and had to remove many of the shots where Dracula's face is decomposing. Somebody in Japan has found an old film print of the missing shots. They're working on getting it restored and clearing the legal bullshit. Hopefully we can see these missing shots one day because it would mean a lot for film history and special effects in general. Even without these extra shots, you don't notice whatever you're missing. It's still an impressive vampire death scene. But Dracula wasn't dead for good. Christopher Lee played Dracula more times on screen than anybody else. In total, seven movies. And that's just for Hammer. He also played the Count in the Italian Jesus Franco film, Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. And he was also in a French comedy called Dracula and Son. But we're going to focus on the Hammer series. So get ready, that's six Dracula sequels coming up. Hammer's first Dracula film was a huge success, but the first sequel, Brides of Dracula, didn't have Christopher Lee, although Peter Cushing returned as Van Helsing. It's definitely worth checking out, and I don't mean to skip over it, but it's not really part of the Dracula series, as far as the character Dracula is concerned. So we're moving ahead to Dracula, Prince of Darkness. It opens with a recap from the ending of the first movie, similar to the Rocky movies. This further reinforces that this is a direct continuation of Horror of Dracula, and Brides of Dracula is somewhat irrelevant. Peter Cushing, unfortunately, is not in it, and he's not in many of the Draculas from this point on. He was busy at the time performing consistently as the Mad Doctor in Hammer's Frankenstein series. This also happens to be the last Dracula film directed by Terence Fisher. The plot follows a group of English tourists in the Carpathian Mountains. While at a pub, they meet a priest who warns them not to go near the castle. Ooh, what castle could that be? Well, of course, that's exactly where they end up. It's an old cliché, travelers having to spend the night at a creepy place. It goes all the way back to the old dark house, and it follows all the way through to the modern slasher genre, where young people are on vacation or are out exploring and go somewhere they shouldn't. The castle is inhabited by Dracula's servant, Clove, who says he always keeps the castle prepared for guests in honor of his master. And they all think to themselves, hmm, Dracula must have been a good guy. What a marvelous man he must have been. Count Dracula. Count, Count Dracula. Dracula. Since when did Dracula have a servant anyway? Clove wasn't in the first movie, but it doesn't matter. Like the Universal films, the continuity is loose. 
Anyway, his true intention is to resurrect his master. He murders one of the guests and hangs his body above Dracula's coffin. It's a creepy scene which plays out like an evil ritual. Then he slits his throat as the blood pours over Dracula's ashes. Then Dracula begins to take shape. It's an awesome transformation. Dracula is back and more badass than before. He's a sexual predator, preying on women and then tossing them aside when he's bored. He's the pimp of the undead. He never says a single word the whole movie. Supposedly, Christopher Lee hated the dialogue, so he refused to speak any of it. I'm not sure how much of that is true, but it's not too out of the ordinary because he doesn't speak during the second half of the first movie either. Once his vampire side comes out, he becomes a mute monster. Christopher Lee didn't like being in the sequels. He felt Hammer was wasting their opportunity with the Dracula character because they were writing the stories first and then trying to fit in Dracula after the fact. And in general, they had very little to do with Bram Stoker's novel. For a sequel, it has a bit more references to the novel than you'd expect. Certain things that were dropped from the first movie are present here. Renfield is in it, even though it's a small part, and we only know it's him because of his interest in a fly. Also, the scene where Dracula cuts open his chest and makes his female victim drink his blood is also from the novel. And before, no Dracula movie ever attempted to portray this gruesome concept. There's also a horrific staking scene. In the final scene, Dracula fights the hero on a frozen castle moat while the ice cracks around them. They had to come up with a new way to kill Dracula instead of sunlight again, so they established that a vampire can also be killed by running water. Yeah, water. Running water. You could probably kill a vampire by looking at him funny. So the Prince of Darkness is trapped under ice and lay frozen until the next films, which were becoming more frequent. Final thoughts. The storyline is very simple and it's not as groundbreaking as the first one, but in some ways, I like it better. There's a lot of suspense building up to Dracula's resurrection and the tension is consistent the whole movie. It doesn't try too hard to top the first one. It just keeps it steady and tense and comes out being a great solid sequel. <laughs> Dracula has risen from the grave. You gotta love the title, and the title screen itself. The movie begins with the discovery of a dead girl in a church. The bite marks on her neck clearly indicate that she's been killed by Dracula. Then we jump ahead a year later, and Dracula is dead, frozen under the ice, which is exactly how he ended up last time. So, wait, let's back up. If we're continuing from where the last movie left off, then who's the girl? She wasn't in the last movie, so when did Dracula have time to run off, kill a random girl, and hang her in a church bell? I feel like this opening scene is really unnecessary. Anyway, Dracula's dead in the ice, but people are still superstitious and frightened of the castle. The shadow of his castle, sir. It touches the church. The castle is still evil. You can feel it. A priest decides that maybe they'll feel better if he goes to the castle, says a prayer, and hangs a cross on the door. Unfortunately, there's another priest with him who falls on the ice, cracks it, and somehow manages to bleed straight into Dracula's mouth. And that's all it takes for him to come back. Not to mention, we see Dracula's reflection. This, I guess, is another movie where they didn't establish the lore. Christopher Lee was still refusing the Dracula role, but Hammer kept begging him. Just to paraphrase Lee from interviews, he said he was told that if he didn't play the part, he would be putting people out of work. He's the most reluctant horror icon. Even if he didn't like it, he's awesome. He doesn't have many lines, but when he does, it always feels important. Now my revenge is complete. Dracula doesn't have many scenes, which isn't that uncommon. Even the novel focused on the characters who were trying to fight Dracula. Dracula was never in the forefront of the story. 
Whether or not this is a good Dracula movie depends how much you care about the main characters. In this regard, I think it's one of the best. The hero is a guy named Paul, played by Barry Andrews. He's not your typical vampire hunter. He's just a regular guy who doesn't even know anything about Dracula until he has to save his girlfriend, Maria, played by the beautiful Veronica Carlson. One of my favorite scenes is when he comes to dinner to meet her parents. Her father happens to be a priest and keeps asking him about where he goes to church. He reveals that he's an atheist. I'm an atheist, sir. Even though he's respectful about it and is just trying to be honest, the father flips out. And you come here to my house? Speaking this blasphemy? I think making him an atheist was a clever idea because that makes it harder for him to fight Dracula. You see, the running theme in all these movies is the power of good over evil. Dracula is repelled by holy signs like the cross, but since Paul doesn't believe in that, that means Dracula can overcome. He drives a stake into Dracula's heart, but it doesn't kill him because he needs to pray too. You must pray! I can't! Normally, the stake would be enough, but this movie changes the myth a little bit. I like that Dracula throws the stake back. His real death scene is much more symbolic. He happens to fall on a cross, representing good over evil, and then Paul finds his faith. You want to know something really weird? This movie is rated G by the Motion Picture Association of America. That's the equivalent of a children's cartoon, yet it has not one, but two stabbing scenes. Both are shown in explicit detail. There's blood coming out the eyes for fuck's sakes. This should be PG-13, at least PG. Of course, there was no rating system back then. Actually, it's a little bit iffy because the film came out the same year the rating system went into effect. So we can assume the MPAA went back and rated this movie without even watching it. Hmm, Dracula has risen from the grave? That's kind of like Care Bears, right? Yeah, give it a G. What were they thinking? The beginning is a bit clumsy and illogical, but the rest is pretty good. I'm interested in what's going on with the main story and not just waiting around for Dracula to show up. It's not the same Van Helsing story rehashed again, and it's not the cliché travelers wander into an old house story. This one is fresh and new. Taste the blood of Dracula. Dracula's blood. It's either one of the most brilliant of the series or one of the most idiotic, depending which way you look at it. What I love about it is the first act. The build-up to Dracula's resurrection is the most interesting of all. It centers around three men who are bored out of their minds. They go out at night to whorehouses, and they just don't know what to do with themselves. So they meet this guy, this wonderful nutcase named Lord Courtley, played by Ralph Bates, who happens to be a Satanist and wants to resurrect Dracula. Doesn't that sound like a fun idea? I mean, how bored could you be to bring back the Prince of Darkness? They don't know exactly what they're in for, but they go along with the plan. The first step is to buy the remains of Dracula. The shopkeeper is a man who collects rare things, he happened to be conveniently wandering through the woods in time to witness Dracula being killed in the last movie. He's kept his powdered blood, cape, and rings safe ever since, and is extremely reluctant to selling them. Getting the different parts to resurrect Dracula, I think, may have been the inspiration for the game Castlevania II Simon's Quest. They buy the items and go to an abandoned church that's been converted into a place for satanic rituals. It's one of the creepiest and most demonic scenes in classic horror history. Courtly wears Dracula's cape and jewelry, says some evil chants, cuts his hand, turns Dracula's powdered blood back into real blood, fills their goblets with it, and orders them to drink. Don't insult the master! Drink, damn you! You drink, then! You drink it! You drink the filth! They refuse, so he drinks it himself, and then convulses in agony until they beat him to death with their canes. Later that night, he transforms into Dracula. 
The rest of the men go back to their families and try to keep everything a secret, while Dracula stalks and kills them all one by one like a slasher villain. The third. The reason Dracula wants to kill them all is out of revenge for killing Courtly, his servant. But wasn't it Dracula's blood that caused him to start gagging to death? And aren't they all partially responsible for bringing Dracula back to life? He should be thanking them. It makes no sense. Dracula doesn't say much, as usual. In fact, he rarely even speaks a full sentence. They have destroyed my servant. They will be destroyed. I've counted the Count's words, and it comes out to 28. Yes, that's 28! <laughs> the most horrible person in the movie actually isn't Dracula. It's one of the men who participated in the ceremony. He's played by Jeffrey Keane. This character is a complete asshole. He's cruel to his family, and he never lets his daughter out of the house. Yet, he goes out to whorehouses. He comes home drunk and tries to whip her for going to see her boyfriend. Notice some jealousy there. Man, he's fucked up. He's the real villain of the movie, and he deserves everything he gets coming to him. Her boyfriend happens to be named Paul. Paul Paxton, sir. Which was the same name as the guy in the last movie. Come on, Paul, come on, join in. You think they could have come up with a different name? Oh? Who else did you expect? In the end, he decorates the church with candles and crosses, making it a holy place once again. When Dracula returns, he doesn't know how to handle it. Wait, he just suddenly noticed that window had a cross? Shouldn't he have thought about that before choosing a church as his headquarters? He looks around at all the holy imagery, falls down, and crumbles into dust. They couldn't come up with a better idea to kill Dracula? Usually seeing a cross would scare him away or burn his skin, but not kill him. And just by looking at them? Couldn't he have just shut his eyes? This movie happens to be rated R, but the last one was rated G. Both of these movies are on the same DVD set, and you can see on the back the ratings right next to each other. G and R. That's two polar opposites. What was so different about this movie? Maybe there was a little bit more blood in it, and okay, there was a little nudity this time, but G and R? Maybe PG-13 and R. The MPAA had no clue what they were doing. Taste the Blood of Dracula is an uneven entry in the series. It has a great beginning, but after that, it goes downhill. I have no further use for you. By the end of the 60s, Hammer's horror series were running out of steam, so they decided to reboot both the Frankenstein and Dracula series, fresh and new, and release them on a double bill in 1970. The films were Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula. Even though they were trying to start Dracula over again, they included a resurrection scene as if they couldn't make up their mind. The movie literally opens with a fake bat flying in and randomly spitting blood on a Dracula's ashes. And there you go, Dracula's back. If they couldn't come up with a better idea, why even include the resurrection scene at all? It's a reboot. I'd talk about the plot, but there isn't much of one. The main character is a guy named Paul. What else? Is it Paul? It's always Paul. Paul, what have you done now? Hammer named their movie characters the same way George Foreman named all his sons. Paul. Well, Paul, again, is on the run from the law. After 30 minutes of meaningless wandering, he ends up at, where else, Dracula's castle. Dracula treats him as a guest and actually speaks a great deal of dialogue for once. At this point, it starts to play out like the original novel where Jonathan Harker arrives at the castle. Paul is seduced by Dracula's vampire girl and ends up sleeping with her. When they awake the following morning, she tries to bite his neck, but Dracula barges in. Without missing a beat, Paul tries to strangle his host. Dracula throws him aside, withdraws a knife, and begins stabbing the fucking crap out of her. This would have been very appropriate had it been a slasher film, and if this was a psychopathic killer instead of Dracula, 
It's amazing. I'm shocked speechless every time I see it. The only thing better would be to see Dracula with a machine gun. Some people have questioned why a knife would kill a vampire, but hey, in the novel, Dracula's killed by a knife, well, two knives. Then he bends down and starts to drink her blood. Well, that's what we can assume, but they cut the scene. Originally, there was supposed to be more footage of Dracula drinking the blood from her corpse. You might ask, why would Dracula drink blood from somebody who's already dead? Well, why does he use a knife? What's wrong with this movie? Paul ends up getting trapped in the castle, and the rest of the movie follows his brother and his girlfriend who go to the castle looking for him. They find Paul dead on a meat hook, and then they have to fight Dracula. That's the best way I can describe the plot without talking about every incident that happens. That's all it is, a series of incidents. Granted, it gives Christopher Lee a lot more screen time than usual, it goes back to its gothic roots with angry villagers, and it draws a few elements from the novel, like when Dracula climbs up the wall. It also has some brief nudity, some major cleavage, and the gore is cranked up high. Dracula tortures his servant with a burning sword, a priest gets his face picked apart by a bat, and there's close-ups of people's mangled faces. It savors every bloody detail. Dracula's death scene is as random as his resurrection, yet it's the most spectacular since his death by sunlight in the first movie. He's holding a metal pole and is struck by lightning. Call it divine intervention if you will, it's still pretty random. If you want to describe this movie to someone, all you need is three words. Dracula on fire. It doesn't get any better than that. And it goes on for a whole minute. Sometimes it's Christopher Lee, sometimes it's a stunt guy, and other times it's a dummy. Eventually, Dracula flies off the castle like a burning meteor, and the movie ends abruptly. Scars of Dracula has some great highlights, but overall, it's just a rehash of everything that's already been done. The characters are flat, the storyline is uninspired, but enjoyable nonetheless. It's some first-rate horror trash. Dracula AD 1972 is another reboot. It starts over again and marks the return of Peter Cushing to the series as Van Helsing. It begins right away with Van Helsing and Dracula fighting each other. It doesn't bullshit around, it gives you exactly what you want to see from the very start. Dracula's impaled on the wheel of a coach, crumbles away to dust, then some random person comes in and collects the dust in a vial. Can't say that's never happened before. Then the credits begin and what? An airplane? Funk music? Cranes? Cars? That's right, we're now in the present time. Like the title says, it's 1972. Next thing, we're watching people singing and dancing. And it goes on and on and on. A bunch of hippies get together to partake in the traditional resurrection of Dracula. Haven't we seen this before? An evil ceremony led by a crazed lunatic who cuts his hand and bleeds into a goblet? It's the same exact thing that happened in Taste the Blood of Dracula, but done much poorer. And of course, this guy becomes Dracula's servant. I like how Dracula doesn't even thank him for bringing him back. I summoned you! It was my will. In other words, I'm Dracula, bitch. Even though the film takes place in the present-day 70s in which it was made, it doesn't forget its gothic roots. Dracula's headquarters is still a gloomy, broken-down castle which looks just as amazing as ever. Peter Cushing also plays a descendant of Van Helsing who happens to look exactly like him. He is just as good as always, even though he doesn't have much new material to work with. How many times do we need to hear him tell the legend of the vampire? A vampire attacks for two basic reasons. Now, firstly, it needs human blood to nourish itself. Secondly, it will attack to curse its victim. Unlike Christopher Lee, who hated being typecast, Peter Cushing embraced it. He plays the part serious, no matter how ludicrous the subject matter may be. Hell, the movie could be about rabbits shooting lasers at robot elephants. He'd still treat it like he's trying to win an Academy Award. 
Bond girl and model Caroline Monroe is in there, but she's only in the dancing scene, the resurrection scene, and then she's killed by Dracula. Too bad. Dracula's servant is a guy named Johnny Alucard. Every time there's a character named Alucard in one of these movies, there's always a scene where somebody's writing down the name just to show that it's Dracula spelled backwards. The same thing happened in Son of Dracula, 1943. It's also incredibly coincidental that this Alucard guy looks exactly like the guy in the beginning who collects Dracula's remains. I can understand the reason to keep Peter Cushing as both versions of Van Helsing, but does every generation in this movie have to be the same actor? It doesn't make any sense. Van Helsing re-establishes that running water can kill a vampire, and furthermore, states that they can be killed by silver as well. And he uses both. He kills Alucard in a shower, and then in the final fight against Dracula, he stabs him with a silver knife. But the Count doesn't stay down for long. Van Helsing's granddaughter, under Dracula's control, pulls the knife out, and that's all it takes to bring him back. But Van Helsing has a plan B. He lures Dracula into an Indiana Jones-style booby trap full of wooden spikes. He burns his face with holy water and forces him onto the spikes with a shovel as blood spurts everywhere. This is a great ending, but you can't take it seriously with all that funk music going on. What's the deal with that? It makes sense to have that kind of music during the dancing scenes, but not during the horror scenes. It would be like watching Godzilla with polka music. It doesn't fit. The movie generally gets negative reactions, but I don't think it's that disappointing. Sure, it takes a big risk by setting it in the present time, but it carries enough of the horror goods we come to expect. We get both Lee and Cushing back together like good old times, and get two Van Helsing vs. Dracula bouts for the price of one. The beginning and ending are great, but the middle is crap. It's a shit sandwich. I have returned to destroy you. <laughs> The Satanic Rites of Dracula, the final Hammer Dracula movie with Christopher Lee. This is the one I've seen the least amount of times. Now that I've watched it again, I've been reminded why. It's an incredibly bizarre mixture of horror, science fiction, and espionage. It's considered to be a sequel to Dracula AD 1972. Other than the fact it's set in the same time period, it has very little connection. It comes off as a completely different film. The tone is much darker, and it takes itself very seriously. It doesn't draw attention to its 1970s time period. There's no hippies, bell-bottoms, or funk music. Dracula's resurrection is not shown or explained in any detail. He just shows up randomly at a half hour into the movie and is never seen often until the last 20 minutes. Christopher Lee always said that Dracula seemed tacked on as if they wrote the story first and then thrown in Dracula after the fact. For this one, it couldn't be more true. There's all these satanic rituals going on and spies running around. It's as far removed from Dracula as possible and doesn't even feel like a Hammer film. It's very slow moving. 90% of the scenes are people sitting around in rooms talking. The good news is that Peter Cushing is in a lot of it. He's the star and single-handedly carries the movie, even though most of what he does is just give exposition. It's an exposition extravaganza with Van Helsing explaining stuff all the time. Every vampire rule in the book is mentioned. They don't cast a reflection or even show up in photographs. He lists all the ways a vampire can be killed. Running water, silver's mentioned again, and a new one is added to the list, a hawthorn bush. Anything else? The hawthorn tree, which provided Christ with his crown of thorns. Dracula's evil scheme goes far beyond biting the necks of luscious young ladies. Now get ready for this. This is the part where you'd either say the series completely jumps the shark or becomes more awesome than ever. Dracula is working on developing a new form of bacteria similar to the bubonic plague that will kill everyone in the world. This brings Dracula to a whole new level of supervillain. He is the devil and he is the Armageddon. That is pretty cool, but you might be wondering how Dracula would survive without fresh blood to feast on. Van Helsing's theory is that Dracula is a cursed immortal wanting to end his own wretched existence and take the whole universe down with him. 
For the last Dracula movie to star Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, it gives them both their moments to shine. Cushing has a doomy monologue where he talks about the Armageddon. But suppose he, just suppose he yearns for final peace, wouldn't he? He'd want to bring down the whole universe with him. The ultimate revenge. And Lee has some great lines and escalates his voice in a way that we haven't heard yet. Four horsemen of my created apocalypse. Four carriers of the plague who will infect their miserable brethren. You, Van Helsing, are now one of the four. It's the most evil speech ever spoken by Dracula in the whole series. It's moments like this I love, but there are silly moments as well. Van Helsing plans to kill Dracula with a silver bullet, something that's usually used for a werewolf, but whatever. He melts a silver cross and uses that to make the bullet. I think it's a little excessive. Isn't it enough that it's silver? Does it have to be a cross too? Then he meets up with a guy named Denim who he suspects to be Dracula. We only see this Denim guy in this one scene and it's no surprise that he's Dracula. We've already seen Dracula earlier in the film and he doesn't change his appearance in any way. Although he talks in a different accent here. It's really weird. It sounds a little bit like Bela Lugosi. He was the servant of this foundation. I am the master. So Van Helsing secretly slips a Bible onto his desk. When Dracula touches it, it burns his hand, making his true identity known. You are Count Dracula. So a Bible can burn Dracula? Man, he is so vulnerable. Van Helsing tries to shoot the silver bullet at him. Think he could have found a smaller gun? One of Dracula's servants screws up his aim. Too bad he only made one bullet. Much later, Dracula and Van Helsing have a showdown in a burning house. It's classic stuff. Then Dracula follows Van Helsing outside, where there conveniently happens to be a hawthorn bush. Dracula walks into it like a dumbass and is stuck with thorns all over his body. He falls down and resembles Jesus Christ with the crown of thorns. Then Van Helsing uses a piece of the fence as a stake and rams it into Dracula's body while he convulses in agony and crumbles away to dust for the final time. In conclusion, it's a mixed bag. The majority of it is too slow and is the weakest of the series, but a few highlights and a great ending make it worthwhile for any classic horror fan. The original working title was Dracula is Dead and Well and Living in London, which is ridiculous. The original American title was Count Dracula and His Vampire Bride. For some reason, this is the only one of the Hammer Draculas to slip into the public domain. That means you can find it on any of those cheap bargain DVD sets. The rest of the series is a bit confusing to find on DVD. The first one, along with 3, 4, and 6, are on a quad pack from Warner Brothers. Number 5, Scars of Dracula, is on an Anchor Bay DVD with bonus features and commentary with Christopher Lee, but unfortunately it's out of print and expensive to find on Region 1. Number 2, Dracula Prince of Darkness, and number 7, Satanic Rites of Dracula, are on a double DVD also from Anchor Bay and with a Christopher Lee commentary on the Dracula Prince of Darkness portion. But again, it's out of print. Anchor Bay, or Hammer, or whoever owns the rights to these out-of-print editions seriously needs to get their shit together and re-release them. It would be nice if all these movies could be owned by the same company and released on one set, but I won't hold my breath for it. There is one more Hammer movie to feature Dracula, Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, a martial arts horror crossover. Peter Cushing is in it, but Christopher Lee is not. They actually got somebody else to play Dracula and is only on screen for a few minutes. I happen to review this one already as part of last year's Monster Madness. Well, starting tomorrow, we're going to spend a week with a certain horror villain from the 80s. Now my revenge is complete. <laughs> Every kid knew about Freddy Krueger, the child killer who gets burned to death, then comes back in people's nightmares. 
So I heard about him before I ever saw any of the movies. I knew about the gloves, the striped sweater, and that he was a wise cracking ghoul. Come to Freddy. But with the first Nightmare movie, it leans more towards pure horror than gags. Though there are a few gags, too. Before this, most slasher films were just a guy with a knife going around killing people. But Nightmare brought a new twist to the genre. The first Nightmare on Elm Street reminds me of the original Halloween in that it has a suburban atmosphere and teenagers having sex, or at least trying to. So we have Nancy, Tina, Rod, and Glenn. And yes, Glenn is played by Johnny Depp. I bet none of the actors in this knew they were working with one of the biggest future stars of Hollywood, though Depp was new at the time and is actually one of the weaker characters in the film. He hadn't yet matured as the respected actor we know today. Sammy. There's just four kids here, whereas the later Freddy films have more characters. I guess they wanted to set up more bodies for Freddy to kill off. Tina's set up at the start to be this film's lead, but she's murdered by Freddy about 18 minutes in. So then Nancy becomes the main star of the film. She quickly discovers that she needs to keep herself awake to defend herself from the horrible nightmares. She spends the majority of the movie drinking coffee and taking pills. Then there's Rod. He gets blamed for Tina's death and gets put in jail. During a dream, a blanket slowly moves around Rod's neck and hangs him. The special effect is pretty well done. Today, that blanket would have been CG, and there'd be no reason for it when it could be done with practical effects like this. It was directed by Wes Craven, and it's really interesting the way he depicts the dream sequences. For example, a person might go from a boiler room to the outside of the house just by jumping. Just like in a dream, locations just switch because none of it really makes sense. And as far as the dreams go, I think they are most effective in the first film, where in later Nightmare films, the dreams become so exaggerated with giant sets and it goes overboard. The father doesn't believe Nancy until the end of the movie. Usually with these 80s horror flicks, there will be at least one veteran actor. With Halloween, it's Donald Pleasance. With Friday the 13th, it's Betsy Palmer. And here, we have John Saxon. He's very believable in the role. Whenever I watch this movie, I get so pissed off that he doesn't listen to his daughter. The parents commit Nancy to a hospital to test her dreams and get her some help. They believe she's just traumatized because of the murders. While in the hospital bed, she starts freaking out during her dream, and when she wakes up, she pulls Freddy's hat out of the dream. And still they don't believe her. Too bad she pulled out a hat. Hell, it's a dream. She should have robbed a bank and brought back a sack full of money. That would have been a plan. A fun fact, the doctor in this scene was played by Charles Fleischer, who did the voice of Roger Rabbit. Hi, me, Eddie. <laughs> she sets up a bunch of booby traps in her home, and the plan is to grab Freddy out of the dream world and into the real world where he's vulnerable to the traps. Wes Craven had a lot of his female stars become survivalists, actually. Gee, Wes Craven likes booby traps a lot. The people under the stairs. <laughs> the hills have eyes. Maybe he should have directed Home Alone. The ending is different in the film than in the original script. Originally, a school bus was supposed to come up to the house and Nancy got on and just rode away into the fog. However, the producer wanted to give a hook for the possibility of a sequel, so they changed the bus to a convertible and when the top comes down, it has Freddy's stripes, like they're in his power. And then the mother is ripped through the door by Freddy's arm. It was all about setting up the next film. Wes Craven didn't like the idea of changing the ending, and I don't blame him. But history is history, and the Nightmare on Elm Street series became a legacy. Freddy himself was played by Robert England in all the movies from the first one till Freddy vs. Jason, and also in the TV series Freddy's Nightmares. Freddy's Nightmares. He's a bit different in this movie than the later incarnations, though he does joke a little. Overall, he's a bit more serious here. When you see him, he's always in shadow, and you really don't get a very good look at his face, which I like because it brings more mystery to the character. As the series went on, it leaned more towards horror comedy, and many criticize him for that reason, but this first one is truly a scary movie. There's nothing more frightening than somebody who can kill you in your sleep when you're completely helpless. For all those kids in the 80s who were afraid to go to sleep, I know how you felt, because I was one of them. The 
Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. With this movie, there's a new family living in the Elm Street house. The son, Jesse, starts having nightmares. The house itself gets hotter and hotter as the movie progresses. The room melts, the toaster bursts into fire, and even a parakeet erupts into flame. Damn! One night while cleaning his room, Jesse and his girlfriend find Nancy's diary. They start learning the history of what happened in the house beforehand. What's with the sunglasses, by the way? Anyway, Jesse gradually starts being consumed by Freddy. He finds his glove in the basement and then sleepwalks to a local bar, which many have said is a gay bar. In fact, people have analyzed the supposed gayness of this movie as much as they do Top Gun. I never even thought of it before. Jesse sees the coach there who demands he goes back to school and do laps. That's pretty weird. If you saw your high school math teacher after school and they told you to pull out a calculator and start dividing fractions, wouldn't you just be like, um, no? So then the gym room starts going crazy like it's possessed. Weights and balls start flying all over the place. The coach is dragged into the showers by jump ropes and spanked with the towel. Then Jesse, now under Freddy's control, kills him. Later in the movie, Jesse goes to his friend Ron for help. Jesse asks Ron to watch him when he sleeps, but that doesn't work because Jesse starts freaking out and literally turns into Freddy. Freddy actually explodes out Jesse's chest and rips what's left of his body to shreds. Then Freddy murders Ron, who's screaming for help. The camera pans back and Jesse's standing there unharmed. The movie doesn't have too many kills, which is a little disappointing. The best part is when Freddy gets loose in the party and starts slicing people up. One guy tells Freddy to calm down and relax. Just calm down, right? Relax. Sure, that'll work. At the end, the girlfriend goes to the power plant where Freddy used to be employed. For some reason, she knows this is where she has to go. On the way in, she sees two fucked up dogs. I guess the faces are Ron and the coach? I suppose this is before they establish that the souls of people Freddy kills goes into his chest. They kill off Freddy, then at the very end, Freddy's in control of the school bus. That's how the movie started, a dream where an out of control bus goes off a cliff. There needed to be a few more cool dream sequences in this movie like that, and I think that's where it's lacking the most. Who's that driving the bus? Yep, that's Freddy. Imagine if Freddy Krueger was driving you to school. That'd be awesome. Overall, the second movie is not as good as the first, but not as bad as most people make it out to be. Check it out. A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. This one is almost as good as the first one. In fact, it may be my personal favorite. It has the right balance of Freddy humor without going overboard and introduces the idea of taking control in your dream. Let's get high. Heather Langenkamp is back as Nancy and is likable. You root for her all the way. Oh my God. And I really enjoy the personalities of the different patients at the hospital. Let's go kick the motherfucker's ass all over Dreamland. Yeah. That guy's great. And I also love the nerdy kid who wishes he was a Dungeons and Dragons wizard. I am the wizard master! Supposedly the scene with the wizard kid went on longer because he's wearing a Dracula cape and shoots lasers at his fingers. There is more to this, but I guess it was cut for time. I don't think it matters anyway where the Dracula cape came from, because it's a dream, and I always just assume that it was his wizard outfit. The new lead is Patricia Arquette as Kristen. Kristen has the power to pull others into her dreams, which she uses to her advantage whenever she needs help fighting Freddy. Each of the kids are killed off in different and inventive ways. The first to go is Philip. Freddy pulls his veins out and drags him around like a puppet, then sends him off the top of a tower. The most classic kill that I always remember is when Jennifer is pulled into the TV with a pair of robotic arms. Right there, that's the perfect example of how I envision Freddy, murdering someone, but funny at the same time. We also get to learn a little more history of Freddy, and whenever they reveal something about his past, it's always something real fucked up that happened to him. Her child, Freddy, the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. 
One of the cast members that plays a hospital aide is none other than Cowboy Curtis himself, Lawrence Fishburne. Boy, big feet. Well, you know what they say. No, what? But big feet, big boots. <laughs> he doesn't add too much to the movie, but he's good even if it is just a bit part. To get rid of Freddy this time, Nancy finds her father, again played by John Saxon, and she asks him where Freddy's bones are buried. The plan is to give Freddy's actual body a proper burial, and that would put him to rest. What's awesome is that when they find the bones, it comes alive into a skeleton with stop-motion animation, just like Jason and the Argonauts. But again, isn't this the real world, so how are the bones moving? Well, apparently Freddy leaves the dream world and takes possession of the bones. It's a little odd, but I don't even care, because it's so awesome. Another cool effect besides the skeleton is when Freddy becomes claymation. That stuff's great, too. Most seem to agree that Nightmare 1 and 3 are the best of the series. They're both good for different reasons. Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. With Nightmare Part 4, it was the first time Robert Englund got top billing. No reason to keep it a mystery anymore, we all know he was the man. So let's see, at the end of the last movie, they successfully kill Freddy by laying his bones to rest. Holy water is thrown on him, and he's pretty much finished off. With Nightmare 4, they had to find a way to bring him back, and I don't think it makes much sense. But regardless, Freddy's back, and so is the remaining cast of characters that survived from Nightmare 3. Freddy kills them all, and the new cast takes over. It's a shame they kill off the characters from Dream Warriors, though, because they were all interesting and likable. We get Sheila, who's some girl with asthma problems. Freddy sucks the air out of her in a classroom scene. The effect looks too ridiculous to be scary. You flunked. Kristen from the last film is a different actress. In part three, she was played by Patricia Arquette. In part four, she's recast and played by Tuesday Night. She's killed off almost right away. The biggest problem I see is that it doesn't seem to follow any of the rules of the previous films. In the first movie, you know when you're seeing a dream, and that's where Freddy was. He had to be pulled out of the dream by Nancy. None of that seems to apply here. It's just all over the place, and there is no world rules. Also, after he kills off the characters from Dream Warriors, what is the point of him killing more people? Wasn't the whole point of Freddy to get revenge on the parents that burned him? That's why Freddy stalked and killed the Elm Street kids. But now they're all dead, so he's just killing random teenagers. There's not enough blood, even when Freddy's stabbing someone. Come on, let's see some blood! The new lead character here is Alice, played by Lisa Wilcox. She gains Kristen's power to pull people into dreams. The new cast gradually dies off, and as they do, Alice also gains their powers. So by getting all this power, Alice becomes the Dream Master. At least I think that's what it is. Who knows, maybe Freddy's supposed to be the Dream Master. Come on out fight me, you chicken shit! One of the teenagers is good at karate. He fights Freddy, Freddy kills him, so when he dies, now Alice is a karate master. She gets the power. Each kid that dies off, she gets some new skill. Alice puts on clothing from all her deceased friends, and that means she also has that stuff on when she's dreaming? So if I put on a pair of red shoes and went to sleep, I would have that in the dream? Hmm. She kills Freddy off, and I have to say, the special effects here are top notch. All the children's souls emerge from his body and rip him to shreds. I saw this when I was a kid, and I thought it was fucking disgusting. You can notice here it says Crave In. Get it? Like Wes Craven? Too bad he wasn't involved in this movie, or it might have been better. Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Well, first of all, it doesn't even say Part 5 during the movie. It's only on the poster. I guess this is where they started not giving them numbers. This one's a mixed bag because it's got some good ideas and some really dumb ones. 
Time to die, you scar-faced limp dick! Alice Johnson, played by Lisa Wilcox, and Dan Jordan, played by Danny Hassel, are back from Nightmare Part 4. They get together, and now Alice is pregnant. The basic idea is that Freddy is using the baby's dreams to get at people while Alice is awake. Hi, Alice! You wanna make babies? <laughs> Not only that, after Freddy kills someone, he places their souls into the baby, trying to make the kid like himself. That's a pretty neat idea. What's he doing to my baby? The movie does have a lot of good special effects work. When Alice's friend Greta dies, that's quite a mess. You are what you eat! <laughs> There's some cool stop motion scenes in the fridge. What is this, Pee Wee's Playhouse? When Freddy emerges from inside Alice, it looks pretty good, and the pool dream sequence has some interesting animation. They reveal some backstory to Freddy. His mother was a nun who got locked in an asylum and raped by a bunch of maniacs. It's some sick stuff, and that's Robert England as one of the inmates. There's a lot of one-liners from Freddy. Back here, damn! It goes too far, it's just total goofiness. With the teenagers in this movie, it's so predictable what's going to happen to them as soon as you see them. There's a nerdy comic book kid named Mark. The first time you see him, he's drawn some superhero in a sketchbook. And as soon as you see that, you know there's going to be a dream about it later. And of course there is. Mark turns into that superhero and fights Freddy. Super Freddy! And he gets killed comic book style. It's kind of creative, but I wouldn't say it's scary. To kill off Freddy this time, Alice has her friend Yvonne go to the asylum to try and find Kruger's mother and lay her to rest. She finds her there, puts her hand on her shoulder, then she disappears. Afterwards, she's in the dream world and takes Freddy away. I don't get it, especially since this character, Amanda Kruger, is in part 3 and nobody touches her shoulder and makes her disappear then. Nightmare 5 is definitely not my favorite, it's still entertaining to watch, but it's convoluted and kind of forgettable. Bon appetit, bitch. Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. This is where the series gets really silly, but has its highlights. Fred Height. Don't be a pussy. The kid's on a plane and slips into a dream, like the Wizard of Oz. He looks out the window and sees Freddy acting like the Wicked Witch. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul, too! <laughs> That's how this movie starts out, really goofy off the bat. There's cameos from Roseanne and Tom Arnold. Also, Alice Cooper as Freddy's dad, now that's awesome. And Johnny Depp is in there too, on the TV, which I think is one of the funniest parts. This is your brain on drugs. Questions? Yeah! What are you on? Looks like a frying pan and some eggs to me. <laughs> This unnamed kid who has amnesia ends up at a homeless shelter where we meet this film's new group of teenagers. They immediately set up each character's personality traits to exploit later in the film. A girl that doesn't want to be touched, a deaf kid, and a kid who does drugs. You can already predict the dream sequences. There's a scene where this guy Carlos is dreaming and Freddy punctures his eardrum. Then he grows another one and the eardrum is ultra sensitive to sound. First Freddy drops some pins, which is painful, but then Freddy pulls out the chalkboard, scratches his claws on it, and Carlos's head explodes. Great scene, and anyone who hates claws on a chalkboard can only imagine what it's like with Freddy's gloves. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. But then there's the death scenes that go overboard. Spencer is a pothead and likes video games. Freddy makes him trip out, which is funny because Spencer's only smoking weed, not LSD. Anyway, he ends up inside the TV, and then Freddy controls him like it's a video game. Spencer's bounced all around the house while Freddy spews out one-liners. Hey, you forgot the power glove! This is a perfect example of Freddy playing entirely for comedy. Now I'm playing with power! Then there's the scene where John's falling from the sky in a parachute. Freddy cuts the straps, and John falls onto a bed of spikes. Freddy pushes the spikes on the street, and it almost resembles a Roadrunner cartoon with Wile E. Coyote setting up a trap. 
John's impaled by the spikes, and in the real world, he's bleeding to death. The woman who runs the shelter is this film's lead lady. Her name is Maggie, and she's revealed to be Freddy's daughter. There's some more dream scenes that give insight into Freddy's past. He had a daughter and killed his wife. We also find out where Freddy got his dream powers from. Some flying sperm made him the master of dreams. Yeah, I think someone was like, hey, we need more things that will fly toward the screen. This is supposed to be 3D, guys. Yes, that's another thing about it. Certain scenes were filmed in 3D. Maggie wants to put a stop to her father's killing spree, and the plan here is to pull Freddy out of the dream world and kill him when he's human, which is basically what Nancy did in the first movie. Freddy actually lists the ways he was killed in the last movies, but he doesn't mention most of them. First, they tried burning me. Then, they tried burying me. They even tried holy water. What about part two, where he's killed by the power of love? What about part four or five? Whatever, those deaths are so weird to explain anyway. I guess they didn't want to remind audiences how absurd they were. So how do they kill off Freddy this time? Maggie gets him pinned to a wall, puts a pipe bomb in his chest, and blows him up. Really? That's it? Just blown up? That's how James Bond villains are supposed to die. Not a being that lives in people's dreams. Maybe this ending looked okay in theaters when it was in 3D, but that's all it is, just a gimmick. The DVD comes with 3D glasses, so you can try it at home, but it still looks like shit. So that's it, Freddy's dead. But nobody should have trusted that title, because he comes back. Come this, bitch! Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Part 6, Freddy's Dead, was a terrible way to end the series, so that's why we needed Part 7 to give proper conclusion to the story of Freddy Krueger. Wes Craven returns with New Nightmare, a unique approach to the Freddy legacy. This film steps outside of the Freddy universe to show the filmmakers actually making the movie, and then the movie becomes real. Miss me? Wes Craven plays himself, who realizes the Freddy character is stepping into the real world, so the only way he can keep him in the fictional world where he belongs is to make another Freddy movie. Heather Langenkamp is the main star. It focuses just on her rather than a whole bunch of disposable characters like before. In order to stop Freddy, she has to become the character Nancy for real. She carries the whole film and does a great job. Fuck you! One thing that gets a little excessive is that she feels earthquakes all the time. After the first three, it's like, geez, we get it. There's also Robert England as himself, Robert England on a stage playing Freddy, and there's the real Freddy. It's a bit confusing to explain, but it all works pretty well. The real Freddy is given a dark makeover. They did a good job reinventing him and making him scary again. He looks a lot like Nosferatu with the long claws. Not to mention, Robert England based Freddy's body language off Klaus Kinski's portrayal in the 1979 version of Nosferatu. But I have to say, I don't care for the green hat they gave him. I wish they could have kept it the same. Oh no, it's the kid from Full House, Miko Hughes. Your uncle is a monkey head. But actually, he's pretty good too. He's also pretty good in Pet Cemetery. John Saxon's back, and he's great as usual. Nancy, Freddy's dead. In this film, Freddy's supposed to be an ancient demon trying to break into the real world. And to do so, he's attacking Heather's son, creating fear so he can be released. It's a good concept, and the final scenes with Freddy in hell is really disturbing. Especially the part with his tongue coming out. Man, that's freaky. I do think this is a great entry in the series, and one of the best. Just not as good as the original. At the end of 1993's Jason Goes to Hell, Freddy's glove pulls Jason's mask underground. And since then, everyone was talking about the idea of Freddy vs. Jason. 
but it took 10 years for the movie to actually happen. The Wait was worth it, and it's one of the best versus movies. A shame they don't make more like this. The plot here is basically Freddy's power has grown weak because people have forgotten him, so he disguises himself as Jason's mother and tells him to go after the kids on Elm Street. Jason goes on a rampage creating fear. Freddy uses that fear to regain his power. But then Freddy gets pissed off because Jason's taken all his victims. She's mine! 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 And then they end up fighting. A bizarre plot, but hey, it works, and it's a great excuse to get him to fight. Both villains have their own strengths and weaknesses. Jason was originally killed by drowning, so his weakness is water. Freddy was killed by fire, so that's his weakness. So it's like a battle of the elements. Whenever you see Jason, you often see the color blue. And when it's Freddy, everything's a fiery red. There's a pothead character that looks like Jason Mewes, you know, from Jay and Silent Bob. But that's not him, although it seems like he's trying to be. Dude, that goalie was pissed about something. There's some inconsistencies with the previous films. There's a scene where a girl falls asleep in a bathroom. Freddy cuts her nose off, then she wakes up like she's completely fine. Did they just forget that if Freddy hurts you in a dream, then he hurts you in real life? The good thing about this movie is that Freddy and Jason don't just meet up at the end for one fight. No, they have quite a few fights, and they beat the shit out of each other. Freddy is more powerful when they're in the dream world, and Jason is stronger when they're in reality. It's great that they established that, because otherwise, it seems Freddy would have won too easily. I like how they use each other's weapons. Freddy uses Jason's machete, and Jason stabs Freddy with his own glove. There's lots of blood, too. If I just walked into the theater during this scene without even knowing who Freddy or Jason was, I'd be like, what the fuck is this? It seems like with these movies, nobody wants to see their favorite monster lose, so they always keep the outcome vague. It's like Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and King Kong vs. Godzilla. You know what I just realized? They all have something to do with water. Yeah, Frankenstein the Wolfman gets swept away in a flood, King Kong and Godzilla roll into the sea, and Freddy and Jason fall into a lake. At first it looks like Jason wins, but then we see Freddy wink, so something is up. Supposedly, the original idea for the ending would have showed them both going to hell and then meeting Pinhead who says, Gentlemen, what seems to be the problem? But they couldn't get the rights to Pinhead. Why not have Freddy vs. Jason vs. Pinhead? Why not Leatherface vs. Michael Myers or Chucky vs. Leprechaun? The door is completely open for more vs. movies and they would make serious money, so it makes you wonder why the fuck don't they make more of these kind of movies? So this would end my review of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, but unfortunately there's a remake. Even though it doesn't have Robert England and it's not part of the same series, I guess I should still say something about it. The production value is high, it looks slick, and it goes back to being serious. I guess that's a good thing, but it still makes you wonder why even bother? It recycles so much stuff from the original movie, it comes off as stale. It has the body bag in the hallway, the girl flying above the bed, the claw in the bathtub, and Freddy coming out of the wall. At least it's not as horrendous as the remake of Psycho, which literally copied every shot in the whole fucking movie. Anyone involved with that wasted their time. Vince Vaughn is Norman Bates. <laughs> oh god, anyway, back to Nightmare. Of course, the coming out of the wall part was CG, and it looks like total crap. The original looked far better, and it was just a spandex sheet across the hole in the wall with careful lighting. The teenagers are all dull, especially Nancy. She doesn't have an ounce of the charisma Heather Langencap had. What's your favorite color? Blue. The new Freddy, Jackie Earl Haley, sounds like the Christian Bale Batman, just like he did in Watchmen. You can't save her! I knew that if they kept making Freddy movies, they'd have to get somebody different than Robert England eventually. I mean, how many times can one guy play the role? He deserves to retire from it. But couldn't they at least get the makeup to look right? It looks like melted cheese. If anything, his face should be all scrawny and eaten away, not all covered up with pounds of makeup like he's got a wet grocery bag over his face. One good thing I can say is the dream sequences are done with good taste, usually taking place in a boiler room or a classroom or something. That's more believable than, say, being sucked into a video game or becoming a comic book superhero or whatever the fuck. 
But other than that, the remake just shouldn't have been made. If you're a big Freddy fan and you want to see a new Freddy movie, this is your only option, so you can take it for what it is. But otherwise, stick to the original, Part 3, and New Nightmare. I think those were the best. I bet you're not surprised that I chose the Halloween series for the last series of this month's Monster Madness. Nothing could be more appropriate. So let's start with Halloween 1978, directed by John Carpenter. It's about the silent, masked killer Michael Myers who escapes from an asylum and stalks babysitters on Halloween night. It's often credited as being the first slasher flick. It's not really true. It's not even the first holiday slasher flick. But it is responsible for bringing the slasher genre into the mainstream and spawning countless imitators. It's also been said that it's the first Halloween themed movie, but that requires a little bit of investigation. It's safe to say this was the first feature length Halloween horror film. It takes the realistic approach where the monster is not a vampire or a werewolf, but a human being. This has been done before with Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, both inspired by the real-life murderer Ed Gein. But in those movies, the victims go to the killer. They visit the Bates Motel, or they travel into a desolate area of Texas. Halloween is a movie where the killer comes to them. It takes place in an ordinary small town. We get familiar with this town very quickly. There's the Strode House, where the main character Lori lives. There's the house where she babysits. And then there's the house where her friend babysits, which are both right across the street from each other. This relationship between all the houses sets up a feeling of reality, which I think helps create the tension and suspense. At last, there's the abandoned Myers house. It's another thing that feels familiar to us. Every neighborhood always seemed to have a house that was haunted by some place where a bad thing once happened. It's something that puts us in a child's perspective and captures our spooky imagination. The movie takes place in the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois. Co-writer and producer Deborah Hill based her idea on this town from the real-life Haddonfield, New Jersey. But the filming took place in California, in South Pasadena and West Hollywood. Wrap your head around all that. The house that was used for the Myers house no longer sits in the same location today. It was moved down the block, repainted, and turned into a chiropractor's office. I'd be a little scared to get my neck cracked there. John Carpenter was a huge fan of the 1951 classic, The Thing from Another World. This is obvious even before he made his own remake. All over Halloween, you can see the characters watching it on their TVs. You can tell he was influenced by The Thing for all the right reasons. He took the same basic concept about people being stalked by a monster and building up anticipation when the monster will strike next. <laughs> Michael Myers is like a ninja, but as a viewer, we're waiting for when he'll sneak up next, and this intensifies our anxiety. It's an old trick from Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense. In interviews, Hitchcock always used this example. You have a scene where two people are sitting at a table talking about baseball. We see underneath the table that there's a bomb. We know it's going to go off, but the characters are too busy talking. John Carpenter knows how to use the old tricks. He managed to take familiar elements and cliches from older movies and combine them all into something that's fresh and new. Jamie Lee Curtis plays Laurie Strode. She's the daughter of Janet Lee from Psycho. This promoted Jamie into her new status as Scream Queen. <laughs> Donald Pleasance plays the role of Dr. Sam Loomis. It can't be a coincidence that Sam Loomis is also the name of a character in Psycho. Loomis was Michael Myers' doctor when he was in the asylum and is now hunting him down. It's like a battle of good and evil, the same way Van Helsing would come after Dracula. In fact, Carpenter's first choice for the role was Peter Cushing, but Cushing had just been in Star Wars the previous year, which made him unattainable for an independent low-budget film. As for Michael Myers, there is no one actor associated with the role. He was played by several people in the first film alone. 
I'll try to list them all, but it's not 100% confirmed. Nick Castle is the best known. He's listed in the credits as The Shape. He played Michael through the majority of the film. Then there's Tony Moran, who is used for the unmasking scene. Whenever Michael was destroying something like smashing a closet, he was played by production designer and co-editor Tommy Lee Wallace. When he's shot and falls off the balcony, he's played by stuntman Jim Winburn. When he kills the dog, he's played by a dog trainer. The young Michael in the beginning is played by Will Sandon. The arm during the long POV shot is Deborah Hill, and it's rumored that John Carpenter himself played Michael Myers somewhere. But if there is any one actor that can be identified with Michael Myers, it's William Shatner. That's his face on the mask. Since this was a low budget movie, they didn't make their own mask. They went to the store and bought any mask they happened to find. They went with a Shatner mask, removed the eyebrows and sideburns, messed up the hair, and painted the face white. The original store mask was created by Don Post in 1975. The same year, a movie came out called The Devil's Reign, starring William Shatner. His face looks identical to the famous Michael Myers expression. The Don Post mask was said to be labeled as a Captain Kirk mask, though it's rumored that the life cast was taken from Shatner on the set of The Devil's Reign. Strangely, Shatner even does the famous Michael Myers head tilt. If there's no connection whatsoever, then it's one hell of an eerie coincidence. When Halloween came out on television, it fell a few minutes under the time slot they needed, so they had to film a few extra scenes while they were in production of Halloween 2. Fans of the first movie might want to check out the extended TV cut for curiosity's sake. Music plays a big part in creating the haunting atmosphere. It was composed by John Carpenter. Without this music and shrieking sound effects, it probably wouldn't be as scary. I think part of the reason it's so scary is because it starts out kind of slow. It lets your guard down, it builds up, and then it hits you in the face. I think there are many boring scenes in the first half, like when the girls are walking around and talking. Except for Lori, they act so ditzy and use the word totally way too much. Totally. 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 Totally wiped out. I don't think you have enough to do tomorrow. Totally. Some of the dialogue is downright awful. Well, who needs books anyway? I don't need books. I always forget all my books. But it's hilarious, and in the long run, it makes the ending more terrifying, because you're not really expecting it. The final chase scene with Lori is still one of the best of the slasher genre. The chase goes across the street back to the house she's babysitting, and has multiple false endings. By the end, you're exhilarated, and it works with every repeated viewing. There's something special about this movie because it's low budget and not overproduced. Every subtle thing about it, like the dead leaves blowing across the street, it all just feels so real and legit. I try to make it a tradition to watch it every October, ideally on Halloween night. That's the perfect mood. Let me set it up. Turn out the lights, light up some jack-o'-lanterns near the TV, Start the movie when the night is still early enough so that trick-or-treaters are coming to your door. But don't answer the door because you're watching Halloween. Put out a witch's kettle full of candy and let those little fuckers help themselves. The sounds you'll hear at your door will set up the perfect ambience. By the time you get to the final chase scene, you'll be completely immersed. As the movie ends on one of the greatest cliffhangers of all time, get up and take a peek out your front window looking out onto the quiet night street. With the music filling the background and the sounds of Michael breathing, you'll swear he's out there somewhere. In the whole Halloween series, Halloween 2 is the only sequel that seems like it had a purpose of being made. The first one ended on a cliffhanger with Michael Myers on the loose. You can just hold that in your mind, that unresolved feeling that he's still out there. Or if you want closure to the story and you want to see what happens next, then you can watch Halloween 2. It's nice to have that closure, but it also sort of demystifies the first movie. Out of all the sequels, it's definitely the most closely connected with the original. John Carpenter returns as the writer, and all the characters that lived through the first movie are still here. Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasance naturally slip right back into their respective roles. 
The biggest connection with the first movie is that it still takes place on the same night. It literally picks up right where it left off. Dr. Loomis is running around trying to find Michael Myers again, knowing that he's dealing with a bulletproof killer whose essence is that of pure evil. No man could take six months. I'm telling you this isn't a man! Laurie Strode has been taken to a hospital after her traumatic experience. Michael's going around stalking and killing random people until it's revealed that Laurie was adopted by the Strode family and that she is really the second sister of Michael Myers. He killed his first sister in the beginning of the first movie, so now he's trying to finish the job and kill Laurie too. That's Michael Myers' sister. Again, it may have demystified some of the motives behind him. I think usually the least you know about Michael Myers, the better. But it is a sequel, so they needed to come up with some new kind of twists. Michael Myers kills people in new ways by shoving someone's face into boiling hot water and jamming a needle into someone's head. It makes you cringe and reminds you how the first movie didn't really need to show much of the murders. This is the beginning of a long tradition where each film has to try to up the ante. One part I have mixed feelings about is when Loomis finds a trick-or-treater who happens to be wearing the same Michael Myers costume. I like the idea that it acknowledges that this is Halloween night and there's a lot of people walking around dressed up, so that gives a reason why Michael Myers can be so difficult to spot. But Michael's costume was so unique. In the first movie, he stole the mask from a store and he took the boiler suit from a worker who he killed on the side of the street. It makes sense that some other random person could have found the same mask, but how did they come up with the idea to wear the same boiler suit? He couldn't have been imitating Michael Myers on purpose because there's no way he could have known yet. This is still the first night. The one thing I love about this scene that I find hysterical is when the police car hits him, rams him into a van, and explodes. It comes out of nowhere. The guy was just walking across the street. I thought the cop did it on purpose, deciding to take a chance on this innocent person in case it was really Michael, which I thought was dark and humorous. But the cop comments that he didn't see him. He came out of nowhere. What a fucking idiot. So what if the guy wasn't in the street? Would he have just crashed into the van? I also like this guy. He's funny. Every other word you say is either hell or shit or damn. I'm sorry. I guess I just fuck up all the time. In the last act, Michael chases Laurie through the hospital. It's not as good as the first chase. I'm not sure exactly why, but I'll try to explain the best I can. I guess because it follows many of the same routines, like when Laurie bangs on the door for someone to let her in, and Michael slowly comes toward her. In the first movie, the fact that Michael takes his time is legitimately creepy, but now it feels like something's off. It feels like he should just hurry up if he wants to kill her. I know that would defy the rules if he ran, but it's a tricky subject. It goes all the way back to the Universal Mummy sequels in the 40s, when the mummy Karras would always follow people while literally dragging his feet. The mummy moves so slow, but somehow always manages to catch up to its victims. Since then, slow-moving killers have been common, like the zombies from Night of the Living Dead and subsequent slasher villains like Jason Voorhees. They tried to counteract this by raising the stakes. Lori can't move as fast because of the injuries she took. They also changed the setting from a neighborhood to a hospital. I'm not sure if that helped any, I think it makes it less scary. Because we see Michael more often than we should, he's out in the open, walking down long hallways. It also seems like a hospital is a place where she should have been more safe. It doesn't have a solitary feeling like before. It's something about the setting and the pacing that made the first movie more frightening. The final showdown repeats the same formula with Loomis coming to the rescue. Except things take an unexpected turn. Michael stabs Loomis with a scalpel. Laurie shoots out Michael's eyes, blinding him. He comically swings the scalpel all over the place. He keeps swinging and swinging. This is the only part of the movie which I think is embarrassingly awful. Loomis turns on a gas valve and sacrifices himself by blowing the place up. We see Michael walking around on fire, which again brings to mind The Thing. But Michael doesn't get much further. The fire takes its toll and he burns to a crisp, the first time in his career that he's been indisputably dead. It's a good sequel, just not as good as the first. It looks like they tried, they really tried, but it proved to be impossible to catch the same creative lightning twice. John Carpenter left the series and moved on to other projects, which were much better choices. Now, let's talk about Halloween 3. 
You understand, with Monster Madness, I do one review a day till the end of the month. But we don't have that many days left, so my first instinct was to drop Halloween 3 altogether because it's not really part of the same series. It was meant to take Halloween in a new direction as an anthology series with a different Halloween story each time. But everyone was confused why it had no connection with the previous films other than the parts where you see the original Halloween playing on the TVs. This movie was so hated and misunderstood that I included it in a video I made called Top 10 Sequels That Aren't As Bad As Everyone Says. I might as well just use the same clip, so if you haven't seen it before, you can see it now. Check it out. Tomorrow, we move on to Part 4. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. I have not once ever heard anyone criticize this movie without focusing their entire criticism on the fact that Michael Myers is not in it. I'm surprised no one complains about Season of the Witch. There's no witches in the movie. Let me start off by saying the Halloween series should have ended right after 2. The last we see of Michael, he's a burning corpse. That's deader than he's ever been in the whole series. That should have been sequel proof. So, they decide to take the series in a different direction and make it an anthology series, each with a different Halloween-themed story. Imagine all the things that could happen on Halloween. I think it would have been far more interesting if they continued in this direction instead of rehashing the same Michael Myers story over and over again. Yeah, looking back, with all the sequels that have come after it, it doesn't make sense to call it Halloween 3 anymore, especially when they stopped numbering the sequels after 5 anyway. And it's even more confusing for most people that the first two movies had Michael Myers. They both took place the same night and are very much like a two-parter. So the third movie sticks out like a sore thumb. So forget that it's a sequel to Halloween because it really isn't. And don't think of it as a slasher movie because it's not. It's about an evil mastermind who wants to return Halloween to its sacrificial origins. The Festival of Samhain. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red with the blood of animals and children. This is a guy who celebrates Halloween hardcore. The synthesizer music is really creepy and gives the movie its haunting atmosphere. The death scenes are really grotesque. Tell me this movie doesn't have balls. It shows kids getting killed. It uses Halloween as a consumer device, a corporate giant that literally devours all the children. It's a different kind of Halloween movie that should be appreciated in its own right. I think Halloween 3 was the best since the original because it was, well, original. The audience could not open their minds and only wanted Michael Myers. They only wanted the same thing over and over again. And that's what they got. Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. One good thing I can say is that the opening credit scene is fantastic. It's all shots of a farmland with your average everyday Halloween decorations, which seem to be overtaken by a dark presence in the air. The appropriately colored orange titles seem to glow in contrast with the gloomy scenery. Rather than going for the conventional Halloween theme music, it uses a chilling atmospheric drone. It captures the pure spirit of the Halloween season. It is perfect. The premise is mediocre. Michael Myers apparently has been in a coma and strapped to a table for the past 10 years. Last time we saw him, he was burning to a cinder. They don't really explain it, they just shrug it off. Then he set him on fire. Both of them nearly burned to death. Yeah, he nearly burned to death, I'd say. Why are they keeping him alive anyway? As expected, Michael wakes up and begins killing people again to celebrate his 10-year anniversary of his last killing spree, that infamous Halloween night in 1978. I would have liked the idea of Michael Myers being a creepy zombie. His flesh should be all burned off. I think it's really a missed opportunity to give Michael a new creepy look, but instead, he's the complete opposite of what you'd expect. He's too bulky and his shoulders are hunched up like a football player. It's also kind of funny how Michael needs to assemble the same costume again. The first thing he does is kill a mechanic and take his suit, 
Then he goes into a store and steals another mask. Of course you couldn't imagine Michael without the same white mask. It's iconic. But this time it's so cheap looking. In the first movie it looked kind of dirty, the hair was all mess, but now the hair is all straight and it doesn't work right. I can't really explain it, but the mask just doesn't seem genuine this time. Dr. Loomis is back again. Yeah, somehow he survived being blown to bits. He's here to kill that little girl and anybody who gets in his way. You know what brought them both back? Box office dollars. That's what. But you know, I'm glad he's back. Yeah, it's the same old shit. Loomis runs around trying to put a stop to Michael Myers and tries to convince the townspeople who are too stupid to remember what happened the first time. He doesn't have much new material to work with, but he plays it off serious and does a great job. Donald Pleasance is always great, and this movie is no exception. The best character in the whole movie is actually a guy who only has one scene. I'm talking about the whiskey-chugging reverend who Loomis hitches a ride with. This guy is awesome. I saw it clear as breasts and blue suede shoes. Would you like a drink? He shares something with Loomis, that they're both trying to fight evil in their own ways. Apocalypse, end of the world, Armageddon, it's always got a face and a name. Notice how Loomis does all the listening here, when usually he's the one talking. The Reverend steals this scene. Laurie Strode is the only major character that doesn't return. It's explained that she died, but they don't elaborate very much. She has a daughter named Jamie Lloyd who lives with her foster sister Rachel. They're both likable characters. Jamie becomes the main target for Michael Myers. The young actress Daniel Harris does a great job, especially during the chase scenes. Like in the second movie, it addresses that there are other people who wear the Michael Myers costume, but it's taken a step further with a whole crowd of pranksters doing it as a joke. What idiots would play a joke on police officers hunting a mass murderer? Hey, don't shoot! <laughs> Pretty funny, guys. You could have gotten yourself shot. Even regular people like hunters and truckers are trying to track down Michael. It's like a contemporary version of the angry villagers in Frankenstein. The most hilarious thing that happens is when Michael picks up a gun. Yes, that's right, Michael Myers with a gun. As if that's not surprising enough. He aims it like he's about to shoot, and then he stabs with it! Pretty effectively, too. It goes right through the goddamn wall. How strong is he? Who the hell goes around stabbing people with a fucking gun? Does he shoot people with a knife? The ending is a bit anticlimactic. Michael falls down a mine shaft, and then he's declared dead. Even though he's survived how many bullets now? He's been burned, he's been hit by a car, but he falls down a pit and nobody expects to ever see him again? In the last scene, Jamie inherits Michael's murderous ways. She stalks and kills her stepmother in the same exact way Michael did in the first movie. The same curse that fell upon him is now on her. It's not a bad cliffhanger and opens up the possibility of having the sequels be about her. But part five threw that idea out the window pretty quickly. For a sequel that had no purpose of being made, Halloween 4 is not that bad. It's well shot, well paced, and has good chase scenes. It's a flawed but satisfying 10 year anniversary to the first film. It felt like the occasion was right. They could have stopped right there. But oh no. They didn't wait long to make Halloween 5. After the financial success of Part 4, they rushed the next one in the theaters no more than a year later, and it shows. The subtitle is The Revenge of Michael Myers. It's on all the posters, but not on the actual title screen. I'm not sure who he's getting revenge on anyway. It begins with a recap from Part 4, showing Michael being shot a gazillion times and falling down the mine shaft. I never considered that a conclusive death, but wait, this time, they throw a stick of dynamite down there? Well, if you would have shown me that before, I would have accepted it. As expected, Michael escapes and lives with a hermit for an entire year before he wakes up from a deep sleep and kills the poor guy. The entire setup to Michael's niece Jamie being the new killer is completely ignored. Some people would say it would have been strange to have a little girl being the killer for a whole movie, but Michael began his killings at a young age, all it meant was that she was destined to grow up the same way as her uncle. 
but this idea got flushed down the shitter. Jamie is now traumatized and being treated in a children's mental hospital. She's having nightmares about her uncle and shares some kind of psychic link with him. It's not explained very well and it's not a very original idea either. In the beginning of Halloween 4, she's having the same kind of nightmares, which in itself was strange because she had never met her uncle yet. I guess it's all about the telepathic link, but it never really pays off. The whole movie we're supposed to root for her, and we do, Daniel Harris does a great job once again, but I still can't get out of my head that Jamie killed her stepmother. Are we supposed to forget about that? Nobody thinks she might do something like that again? Rachel, who is the only other likable character from part 4, is killed off early in the film when Michael stabs her with scissors. Donald Pleasance is still good as always. Some would say his performance comes off as being tired, but that's the way I'd imagine Dr. Loomis would be after all this time. I think he delivers one of his best lines since the first movie. I prayed that he would burn in hell, but in my heart. I knew that hell would not have him. But unfortunately, not even Donald Pleasance can save the rest of the movie. The new characters suck. That's the best way I can put it. They're ditzy, stupid, and annoying. <gasps> I'm never sensible if I can help it! All they do is play pranks on each other. <laughs> the gags wear old very fast. It goes on and on and on. The cops show up just in time to save a girl from being stabbed by Michael Myers, but the mask comes off and it's just some dumb fuck playing a joke. The police officers are pointing guns at you and you think it's funny? Notice how after the cops realize it's a joke, they still never lower their guns. After this scene, we're given a false buildup where Michael Myers <laughs> is closing in for a kill, but surprise, it's another prank. This time, it was extremely predictable because we've already seen it before. Also, I think it really starts to undermine Michael's true presence. When he's around, now we don't even care as much because it could just be some other trickster. It's all built around cliches. Once all the characters are disposed of, the focus goes back to Jamie and Michael Myers, and then the movie starts to salvage itself a little. I like the part where she's in the laundry chute and when Dr. Loomis is talking to Michael, but there's still many ridiculous moments, like when Michael chases Jamie in a car. Even when driving, he really takes his time. The final chase ends up at the Myers house, but now it looks absolutely nothing like it did in the first movie. What happened? It's just like the Frankenstein castle, always changing. Maybe it was a tribute. Let's talk about Michael a little bit. His mask looks way scarier than it did in part 4, but I still disagree with the choice to use such a large man to play him. One thing unusual is that you actually see his true face. Twice. The first time is in the beginning when he's in the hermit's house. It's a background shot, but you can clearly see him unmasked. The second time is a touching moment near the end when Jamie calls him uncle. Uncle? He takes off his mask, and yes, it's kind of dark, but you can still see the face. I remember back in the day, I used to pause this shot to get a good look. The VHS version must have been darker because back then I couldn't see a thing. The close-up of his eye shedding a tear is strange because his eyes were shot out in part two, and after all the abuse he's been through, I don't think he should have looked so perfect. Then you see another shot where you can briefly see his face in the light. He looks just like an ordinary guy. I still say he should have been like a zombie. Oh, would that have been too much like Jason Voorhees? Well, who came first now? Dr. Loomis takes Jamie as bait. I know he's got to do whatever he can to get Michael Myers, but this is really out of character for him. Get get the little girl, the little girl. Whoa, he's gone insane. He drops a chain net on Michael, he shoots him with tranquilizer darts, and whacks him repeatedly with a wooden plank. There's an odd moment where he collapses next to him. Looks like he's about to kiss him. Then Michael ends up in jail, still wearing the mask. What prison would leave a mask on a criminal? I know the filmmakers just don't want to show his face, but they already did. And besides, they could leave the prison cell dark or shoot it in a way that you don't see his face, but whatever. 
a guy in black approaches the jailhouse. Now, let me back up and explain. All throughout the movie, we've seen this guy walking around. He's never been identified. He happens to have a symbol of a thorn on his wrist. Michael has the same thorn, and we also see it on the walls in the background. What does it mean, and should we even care? So this guy in black breaks into the cell. We see a silhouette in the window, which would have been more appropriate for Dick Tracy. Jamie walks into the blown out prison room, completely unattended, and finds that Michael is on the loose again. And that's the end. I don't think there is any reason to end the movie this way. When Michael was sitting in that cell, the police officer said that they'll keep him there till he dies. He'll never die. That is chilling enough and would have been a fine way to close the movie. It would have left open the possibility of a sequel, but by having him break out made it more sudden and urgent. Now there has to be a sequel. Who's the guy in black? There were thoughts that maybe it was Michael's twin brother, but nobody knew. Not even the writers. Seriously. So if they didn't have a good plan, what was the point of opening the lid? Since we know how they abandoned the last cliffhanger, why should we even give a shit about this one? Halloween 5 is one of the weaker sequels. This is the first of the series that I simply don't recommend. Six years after Halloween 5's ambiguous cliffhanger comes along Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers. The curse of Michael Myers. Yes, you've finally done it. You have completed the pattern of Pink Panther sequel titles. 4 was Return, 5 was Revenge, and 6 was Curse. Granted, they sounded like horror movie titles to begin with, but the Pink Panther connection is awesome and hilarious. One of the original working titles was Halloween 666. It's the last of a trilogy of continuity with 4, 5, and 6, which all center around the character Jamie Lloyd. In fact, fans refer to this as the Thorn Trilogy because of the weird thorn symbol. I'll always call it the Pink Panther Trilogy. There's two versions of this movie. The producer's cut, which currently only exists as a low-quality bootleg, and the theatrical cut, which is the version most people have seen. After a six-year hibernation, Halloween fans were really looking forward to this one because of the loose ends that Five left us. Who's the guy in black? What's the thorn symbol mean? These were questions that we'd hope Six would answer. Well, we got answers, and more questions. Let's talk about the original producer's cut. Michael Myers' niece Jamie is now a teenager. She's been abducted by some cult and is giving birth. She escapes with the kid and is chased by Michael Myers. We already know that Michael wants to kill all surviving members of his family. That's what he does. So the baby is clearly the next target. That makes enough sense. Meanwhile, the Strode family who had adopted Lori are now living in the Myers house and Tommy Doyle, who was the kid who Lori babysat in the first movie, now happens to be living across the street. Haddonfield is one strange place. The first time we see Tommy, he's spying on a half-naked woman with a camera. Isn't that a great way to introduce the hero of the movie, to make him into a pervert? Tommy speaks in the same emotionless tone and blank stare the whole movie. I won't let anything happen to you. He sucks. Young Danny Strode is seeing visions of the man in black who orders him to kill. We can assume this is the same thing that happened to Michael Myers as a young boy. After all, I think it's supposed to be the same bedroom but they don't follow up on it. Danny never becomes the new Michael Myers or anything like that. Donald Pleasance is back as Dr. Loomis, retired from his life work of pursuing Michael Myers. But soon he becomes aware that Michael's return to Haddonfield and begins once again going around delivering his pure evil speech. He doesn't have much to do, but it's nice to see him back one last time. Michael follows Jamie to a farmhouse and stabs her, only to find that she's hidden the baby. Tommy Doyle finds the baby in a bathroom and takes him, naming him Stephen. The big question is, who is the baby's father? You don't want to know. We'll get to that soon. Well, Jamie dies in the hospital eventually, just so you know. Alright, Tommy dumps the whole backstory of Michael Myers on Mrs. Strode, who he was spying on half-naked earlier. 
He explains that the sign of the thorn appears in the constellations during Halloween. It signifies a druid curse that spreads famine and disease. It could only be stopped by a sacrifice of an entire family. So Michael Myers is under the influence of a sacrificial cult and that's why he's trying to kill the rest of his own bloodline. Okay, so that explains why he kills people, I got that, but it still doesn't explain why he's immortal and why he kills almost everyone he meets. Not a very efficient killer, is he? And let's not forget, not only is he trying to kill Jamie and the baby, he's trying to kill the whole Strode family because they're living in his old house. And it's just a goddamn coincidence that they happen to have been the foster family of his sister Lori. There is too much going on. The only thing I like is that they tried to link it to the creepy sacrificial origins of Halloween. It's the first time that's been attempted since Halloween 3. But overall, the idea of Michael Myers being reduced from a mysterious killer that acts on his own will to being a pawn of a cult is a terrible idea. He was more frightening when he was his own entity killing people for no explained reason. In the first movie, when Dr. Loomis explains that he's pure evil and has the devil's eyes, that's all you ever needed to know. Giving him all this backstory and making someone else in control of him flat out ruined the whole thing. The man in black is finally revealed to be the leader of the cult and is actually Dr. Wynn, who is an old colleague of Dr. Loomis. He was a minor character in the first movie, so it's another attempt to connect it with the original. Now, let's talk about the baby. Who's the father? You really want to know? Well, guess what? It's Michael Myers. The baby is yours, isn't it? Isn't it, Michael? Michael Myers impregnated his own teenage niece. What kind of sick, fucked up idea is that? And why did the cult make him rape her? What did they accomplish by creating a new inbred relative to Michael Myers only for him to kill? If he wanted to kill off the last of his bloodline, he should have killed Jamie right there, not have sex with her. It doesn't make any sense. During the last act, Michael Myers is downplayed. He doesn't kill anybody, he doesn't do anything, he just stands around. Just a tool for the Thorn Cult. He is put to rest in the most absurd way imaginable. Tommy stops Michael by placing a bunch of stones on the floor to make an anti-thorn symbol to repel the curse. This renders Michael motionless, standing in place like a statue. And that's it. Michael Myers, the unstoppable killer who's been shot, fallen off a balcony, burned in a fiery explosion, been hit by a car, fallen down a shaft, beaten senseless all over the place, is now stopped by a bunch of stones on the floor. Great. Then, in one of the strangest and most confusing endings ever put to a motion picture, Loomis finds Michael, now laying on the floor, unmasks him, and finds out it's Dr. Wynn. And Michael Myers is now dressed as Wynn. So I guess they switched costumes so that Michael could be on the loose again. Big deal. And to top it off, Loomis sees the sign of the thorn on his own wrist and starts screaming like a lunatic. <laughs> I assume this means that Loomis is now cursed to take the place of Dr. Wynn as Michael's caretaker. Okay, so if they're going to pass the job on to anyone, why Loomis? If Wynn was Michael's caretaker for this long, why not pass it on to someone younger? I know they wanted Donald Pleasance to stick around for more sequels. Who wouldn't? But quite frankly, the man was old. In fact, he passed away right after they finished shooting. Even if he wouldn't have been around for another sequel... I don't know how exactly they could have followed up on this cliffhanger. This movie was such an atrocious mess that they couldn't even release it in theaters the way it was. They had to shoot new scenes and re-edit it, which unfortunately didn't help a whole lot. The original cut is known as the producer's cut, which is strange because it's the only producer's cut of any movie I've ever heard. Typically, in a situation like this, it would be a director's cut, with the producer's cut usually being the one that makes it to theaters. Well, the theatrical version makes lots of cuts and adds new scenes. The first major difference is that Jamie is killed earlier when she's in the farmhouse. Michael impales her on some farm equipment, which is far more graphic than the producer's cut. Another memorable difference is a scene when Michael electrocutes Mr. Strode. Now his head explodes, which is awesome. Any horror fan's gotta love a good head explosion. It's a minor but welcome addition. 
The final act, which almost entirely ignored Michael Myers, now has him going on a killing spree, turning the place into a bloodbath. The strobe effect is a bit excessive, but at least it reinstates Michael Myers as the uncontrollable killing machine that he's supposed to be, and not just some cult leader's henchman. Unfortunately, a lot of Dr. Loomis is cut from this version, and he's absent during most of the last act. So it's a trade-off, you either get more Loomis or more Michael Myers. The ridiculous stone ending is scrapped, rightfully so, but instead, we get another ridiculous ending. Tommy beats Michael to a pulp with a lead pipe. For no good reason, there's all these strobe flashes. Is he bleeding green? If it's supposed to be blood, it's definitely not red. Tommy's such a schmuck, look at that cocky grin. And believe it or not, this is how Michael meets his end. Are you kidding me? A fucking pipe? That's the best idea they could come up with? Then we see one last shot of Dr. Loomis, taken randomly from the original cut where he says he has unfinished business. Come with us. No, I, I have a little business to attend to here. What's he gonna do, beat Michael with that cane? Then we cut to a shot of the mask with a needle next to it and hear Dr. Loomis scream. The scream is taken from the original cut when he saw the thorn on his wrist. It's the last sound Donald Pleasance ever uttered on film. What a way to go out. Any way you look at it, Halloween 6 is a mess. A great big incoherent convoluted and spectacular mess that shits all over the Michael Myers legacy. You don't have to take my word for it, the producer's cut seems to have gotten unanimous praise from fellow horror fans. Sorry, but in my own opinion, both are horrendously bad in their own ways. The producer's cut is the one that explains Michael Myers' is Uncle Dad. I'm better off without that explanation. If you really want to follow the whole Thorn thing, then the producer's cut is for you. The theatrical version explains less, but at least makes up for it with some entertainment value. The ending with the lead pipe is horrible, but at least it's funny. It makes me laugh out loud instead of the original ending, which makes me pull the hair out of my head. I'd rather it be laughably bad than frustrating and bad. Both are awful. Pick your poison. Enough! But is Michael Myers... Bullshit! The Halloween series was a broken down mess. The first was a classic, the second was a bit tired, the third started fresh with a new idea but failed miserably in the public eye, the fourth brought back Michael Myers and started planting the seeds of absurdity, the fifth escalated to new heights of ridiculousness, and the sixth shat all over the whole Michael Myers mythology. There was nowhere to go after that. It was ruined. It was deep into the 90s, the slasher genre was worn out, but it was often parodied in movies like Scream. Scream made constant references to Halloween and introduced new audiences to it. It was like the genre had gotten a newfound attention, myself included. I had recently become a fan of the Halloween franchise and noticed how the sequels kept getting worse. I wanted to see one good final Halloween to salvage the whole mess. The occasion was ripe. It was the 20 year anniversary of the first movie. It was announced that the new movie would go back to basics and ignore all the sequels that came after too. With no Donald Pleasance, who would be the star? Well, Jamie Lee Curtis, who left the series long ago, had become a major actress since then. I had no idea she would ever return for another Halloween movie, but she did, and with love and affection. Michael! The first Halloween launched her career and now she was returning the favor by coming back for the 20th anniversary. There was no better time to be a Halloween fan. This was the first Halloween movie I saw in the theater. This is when they started releasing them in August instead of October, which I'm very much against. The title is a little lame, H20 or H2O as it's usually called. Just because the abbreviation happens to be the chemical formula for water, does that mean we have to call it that? Another returning actress is Nancy Stevens as the nurse. She was a minor character in the first movie. 
Also, there's Jamie's mother, Janet Lee, from Psycho. This scene makes a tribute to Psycho. That's the same car, and the music sounds very similar. Rather than taking place in Haddonfield with the suburban town setting, it takes place in Northern California at a high school. Lori Strode's in charge of the school. She's changed her name to Carrie Tate, and let's not forget, she was originally Lori Myers. She's got a lot of names. She has a son named John and a boyfriend named Will. Her life seems pretty stable, except when it's Halloween. All her tragic memories from that night 20 years ago keep returning to haunt her. Michael Myers already made his appearance in the first scene, so we know that her fears are legit. If this is really supposed to be a continuation of Halloween 2, there's no explanation how Michael Myers survived the fire. They never even mention the fire whatsoever, they just say his body was never found. This sounds like they're talking about the first movie when he fell off the balcony and then disappeared. That would make sense, so I think it picks up after the first Halloween. Two through six never happened. Michael Myers looks similar to how he looked in the first movie, rather than being built like a football player. I'm glad they got his physique right, but you see his eyes too much. I always envision two black holes, but that's my personal preference. I just think he's scarier when you don't see his eyes. There are some moderately suspenseful moments, but most of the film relies on cheap shocks. Why does everyone keep sneaking up on Laurie all the time? Couldn't they just say hello? Michael spends most of his time stalking John, his friends, and the security guard played by LL Cool J. This is all a warm-up to the final confrontation with Laurie versus Michael. That's what the movie's all about. In fact, you don't even see John that much during the last act. He's a throwaway character. This movie belongs to Jamie Lee Curtis and no one else. She beats the shit out of Michael Myers. It goes on and on. It isn't even scary anymore. It's like a slapstick comedy. Michael's now the victim. In fact, I heard one of the original titles was The Revenge of Laurie Strode, which would have been very appropriate. Yeah, there's nothing scary about it, but it has a triumphant feel. When I saw it in the theater, people were cheering. It felt great to see Laurie have her revenge. She's tired of hiding, she's tired of running, now it's time to kick ass. It's time to put Michael Myers down for good. This gang-raped, bitch-slapped, broken-down mess of a series had to end. Let's fucking end it for good. There's a false ending where Michael's body's taken into an ambulance. We know what's gonna happen. The ambulance is gonna drive off. Michael's gonna wake up and kill the driver. Yeah, just another predictable cliffhanger. Oh, wait! Lori's stealing the ambulance. She's not having it. She's like, fuck you, cliffhanger. That's what you call a smart character. Michael wakes up, but she's ready. She hits the brakes, smashes him through the windshield, runs him over, and traps him between the vehicle and a tree. In a touching moment, brother and sister reach for each other, and then Laurie cuts his fucking head off. The reaction in the theater was priceless. Everybody was applauding. I'm not sure if they were applauding for the same reason as I was, but I was glad to see that the series was given a proper finale. I still think his death in part two was the most conclusive, because his whole body was burning away. But anyway, his head came off. It didn't look like he'd be coming back. H2O was great when I saw it in the theater, but since then, it doesn't hold up as well. It's okay. I don't have any major complaints or praises for it. It's just alright. Anyone who wants to avoid the sequels can skip to this one and see how the series should have ended. I repeat, should have ended. H2O put a nice cap on the series, but it didn't take long before another sequel came along to open the lid again. Halloween Resurrection. With a cliché title like that, who could take it seriously? Trick or treat, motherfucker! Last time we saw Michael Myers, he was decapitated, but they'll do anything to bring him back for some more bucks, even making an explanation that it wasn't him who was decapitated. It was a paramedic who Michael had switched costumes with but not before grasping his throat, rendering him speechless. 
so Lori had accidentally killed the wrong guy. It drove her insane, and now she's in a mental hospital. Yep, that's Jamie Lee Curtis back for one last time. She's killed no more than 15 minutes into the film. Somehow, I feel relieved, as if she's officially calling it quits in hopes that the filmmakers would be inspired to do the same. It's sort of another tribute to her mother Janet Lee in Psycho, whose character was abruptly killed off early in the film. Two TV producers, played by Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks, are running an internet reality show where six college students have to spend a night in the former Myers house. Digital cameras are placed around the house and head cams are attached to all the people. The head cams were actual running cameras. Even though the movie was shot on film, they often used the digital footage to show the characters' POVs. The whole reality horror thing had started with the last broadcast and exploded into the mainstream with the Blair Witch Project. So it was all the craze at the time, plus the booming technology of internet video. I can't blame them for wanting to take this step with the Halloween franchise. I think it would have been a great idea to make an interactive DVD out of it. While watching the movie, you could switch between the different camera angles at any time and see what the different characters are seeing. Even as a non-interactive movie, it at least tries to make the series scary again by giving it a raw, homemade feel and trying to put us in the characters' perspectives. Maybe it didn't work so well, but I at least have to give them credit for trying something new. The biggest problem is that the characters all suck. We don't care if they live or die. The situations don't seem right. Why are they getting nude when they know they're being watched live all over the internet? Why don't the police ever show up? Why don't they leave the house? Something just feels off the whole time. It's a shame that Michael Myers' final outing in this series is with a kung fu kicking, one-liner spewing Buster Rhymes. Hey Mikey! Happy fucking Halloween! It makes a complete mockery of the franchise. It couldn't be worse if they threw a pie in Michael's face. There's a part earlier when Buster Rhymes is dressed as Michael Myers, trying to scare the people in the house. But he runs into the real Michael Myers and thinks it's another person stealing his act. I'm playing Michael Myers! If them kids come around and see us dressed up in the same shit, you're gonna ruin the whole effect! I damn it! There's something incredibly funny about Buster Rhymes shouting in a Michael Myers costume. You don't get it? You don't get it? Yo shit ain't working up there or something? The ending has Michael burned, but then he gets up again, leaving us on another bullshit cliffhanger. Out of the whole Halloween series, I have the least amount of feelings for this one. I didn't see it in theaters and pretended it didn't exist. It wasn't until much later when I finally broke down and watched it. It's entertaining at least, I just wish the series could have ended with H2O, but instead, this is the one we're stuck with as the final film of the series. Fuck up. Trick or treat, motherfucker. <laughs> it's Cine Massacre's Monster Madness! Happy Halloween. I finished reviewing the entire Halloween series, but I have one day left, so I might as well talk about the 2007 remake and sequel, both directed by Rob Zombie. I'm a big fan of Rob Zombie's music, but his movies are hit or miss. House of a Thousand Corpses had its moments, but was an overall mess. The Devil's Rejects was awesome because the characters actually work. His remake of Halloween is a mixed bag. It begins when Michael Myers is a young boy and doesn't show adult Michael until about 40 minutes into the film. The good thing about this is that it has the chance to be its own movie. Some like the way it behaves as a prequel, and others don't. I'm personally not a fan of the young Michael. I don't believe that this kid would grow up to become this unstoppable killer. I know he's supposed to look ordinary and unassuming, but there's nothing that clicks. How does one grow up to become a serial killer? Why, they come from a dysfunctional family, of course. How simple-minded could you get? It doesn't explain very well why he becomes the way he does, nor does it keep it mysterious enough. It falls in the middle. Not to mention, what kind of steroids were they giving him in that asylum? The music cues are a bit odd. Love hurts. Love the use of the song Love Hurts has me scratching my head, and the famous Halloween theme, believe it or not, I think is used at inappropriate times. It's used too often and too early in the film. 
I think it should have been saved until he first put on the mask, or at some point when the evil has taken shape. Paying tribute to the original is fine, but it gets carried away a little. Once Adult Myers is on the loose, it starts recreating scenes from the original, not all of which are necessary. The characters are ditzy like in the original, and so is Laurie this time, always being overly animated. The movie on the TV is The Thing, just like in the original. It's a rare case when a movie pays tribute to another movie's tribute. The biggest problem is that it is not subtle in any way. It goes straight for the violence. Michael is not efficient or ninja-like with his killings. He takes a blunt approach and murders his victims with over-the-top beatings that are far more graphic than they need to be. It's a very angry and psychotic remake. It's so over-the-top it actually becomes comedic. The dialogue is just as obscene. Think she'd suck my dick for a quarter and let me suck her tits? If you think of it as a dark comedy, it works. Malcolm McDowell is very good as Dr. Loomis, and Brad Dourif is also good as the Sheriff. A lot of the cast includes Rob Zombie regulars like his wife Sherry, William Forsythe, and Sid Haig. It also has Danny Trejo and Danielle Harris who played Jamie Lloyd in Halloween 4 and 5. Rob Zombie always seems to be very good at creating psychotic characters. Some of these nutcases are even more interesting than Michael Myers. The final chase scene is tense, riveting, and gritty. Even though the negative things I have to say seem to overweigh the positive, it's still worth seeing. I'm generally against horror remakes, but this one I prefer to another mediocre sequel. It has a major stylistic difference that makes it feel like a breath of fresh air. It's very much like a modern grindhouse film. It feels like I'm watching trash. Good old-fashioned blood-soaked trash, and I think that's what Zombie had in mind. The sequel, Halloween 2, well, what a movie. I don't really know what to say about this one. I'm a bit more forgiving because it's not a remake anymore, it's a sequel. So it can be viewed as its own thing. It has to be viewed as its own thing, otherwise you'll hate it. You have to go into it with the mindset that you're watching garbage. Weird garbage with weird sick fucks talking about having sex with corpses. Weird young Michael doppelganger, weird white horse subplot, weird dream scenes, weird Al. That's right, weird Al Yankovic. Watch this scene where Michael stabs the fucking crap out of the nurse. I never thought the idea of Michael Myers killing someone would ever be so funny, but it's hilarious because it is so ridiculously over the top. How many times does he need to stab her? Then there's a long pause, and he stabs her one more time for good measure. The timing has to be intentionally funny. Check out this scene where he smashes a naked stripper's face into a mirror again and again and again. Jeez. The characters go through major changes, which I think is a good idea to keep it fresh. Lori is now traumatized and gets all punked out, no longer the happy-go-lucky chick from the first movie. Dr. Loomis is now a bitter man who's criticized in the press for exploiting Michael Myers in a book he wrote. It's very exaggerated, but Malcolm McDowell still manages to make it work. Visually, it's a great film to look at. The dream scenes and the party scenes at least make it feel like it's Halloween. The Halloween theme music is sorely missing. The last one overused it, but this one doesn't use it at all until the end credits. Michael Myers spends a lot of time walking around unmasked and has taken the appearance of a hobo. In the last scene, his face is shown illuminated and in close-up. He's played by Tyler Maine, but looks mysteriously like Rob Zombie. And believe it or not, he actually speaks. Die! Die? After all the years of Michael Myers never speaking, the first thing he says is die? For a guy who goes around killing people, it seems a little redundant. What's really strange is that I don't remember this part when I saw it in the theater. It seems they changed the ending for the DVD, at least the one I have. In the version I remember seeing in the theater, Laurie stabs Michael with a knife and that's how he dies. It didn't make any sense because at the end of the last movie he was shot point blank in the face. So if he can survive being shot, how can he be killed by being stabbed? In the DVD version, he's gunned down by police officers. It still doesn't make sense because he's been shot several times before, but at least it's better than the theatrical ending. Halloween 2 is the most bizarre mainstream horror sequel I've ever seen released by a major studio. It's a movie that doesn't give a fuck. This concludes Monster Madness 2011. Now go watch some scary movies. I'll try to do the same.
It's Halloween, and everybody's entitled to one good scare. <laughs> It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Happy fucking Halloween!